10. Yeah, okay. I, 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 um, I do not know we're if set. me yet. We're set, but I don't know if I'm on camera. It doesn't seem like I am. <laughs> You're not on mine. Oh, we just great. have a picture. It's just my picture. Right? <laughs> yeah. Great. Absolutely fantastic. Let me check the settings then. Watch the camera, all um, that. Yes, yes, yes. Save. Can you please work? <laughs> I don't worked on trial. The, the same, same setup as you had the other day? This is the exact setup that I've had before. I do not know why this thing is screwing up now. I have nothing here that is using the camera, so I... Oh, hang on for anybody watching this. Hang on. I don't know what's going on with my on my end. Um, all right. Let me. If I click on turn camera off, and then turn camera back on, will that? There we go. There. Stupid. No. Okay. Oh, there. Hey you guys. Are. Yeah. So um, as I stated before, we're gonna be doing a hangout today. I, I I should have told you guys this yesterday, but I was still freaking scatterbrained and I freaking forgot to let people know that I was planning on doing a hangout today. Hopefully I gave people enough warning earlier this morning about it. Um, but basically, um, this is a hangout that I've wanted to do for some time because it's with one of my oldest subscribers, Richard Roy. I think he's been around since the beginning, back when my channel just was, like, non-existent. Um, I mean, right now my channel is ridiculously small, so it might as well be non-existent. But, like, before when I was only having, like, maybe a couple, like 50 people or so, I think he was around even then. So, concerned that I've done hangouts with other people, such as Scholar Grim Nilsson and Devil Man Chaos, I figured, you know, it's only fair that I would do one with Richard Roy as well, considering that he's done some with others, and it makes no sense to me not to do one with a guy who's been around for so long. So, mm. And this here is a non-alcoholic, just in case anybody cares, non-alcoholic margarita mixed with a couple of scoops of ice cream in it. Yes, I know it sounds weird, but trust me, it tastes good. So, without further ado, um, let's introduce Richard Roy. Hello. <laughs> Good to be here. I'm afraid that uh, I'm, I'm drinking a, a beer. Ain't nothing wrong with that. First one of the day. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm a beer lover. I can't help it. But uh, It's not just for breakfast? I, well, <laughs> it's not a breakfast drink. <laughs> Uh, no, for, for for me, I don't like getting drunk. I don't like getting uh, out of control. So, uh, I'm not, I've never been a heavy drinker. Okay. Unlike uh, some other members of my family. <laughs> I I can identify with that. Oh, also, I need to <laughs> warn. Um, I need to warn some people. Um, there might be a chance during the hangout that my son might come barreling through the side door. He's outside playing with his friends. But every now and then he comes crashing through. So just in case that happens, I'm just giving you guys a warning. <laughs> All right, it could happen. <laughs> Duly noted. Thank you. <laughs> All right. So anyway, let's just get started. We're pretty much just gonna, you know, just do the shit. Um, just talk about various things. Though knowing yeah. that's most likely going to end up waxing philosophical. So for anybody who's interested in hearing that sort of stuff, I guess just stay tuned. Anyway, um, I'll just let you oh. start. Hmm? Okay, uh, one uh, technical note uh, just to start with. Uh, this little thing here, this is my uh, one of my microphones, and I'm wondering, is this... I'm can you not, hear that? I am I just hear a little tick, 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 but it doesn't sound like it's coming from the microphone. It sounds like it's... Okay, let me try something else now. Uh, can you hear this? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Then I know where the sound is uh, being recorded through. It's going through the camera. I hate that. I'm trying to get it to do it through this damn microphone I have here. It's a Logitech, I think, but uh, and it works pretty good when it's working. <laughs> uh, it's just a matter of I don't understand how to get this out. Anyways, it's nice from that. As long as you can hear me and everything, at least I know where the buzzing noise was coming from. It's coming from that damn monitor I got the camera sitting on. Mm -hmm. um, Oh, I, I saw a video of yours you put up the other day, uh, the, the idea of the difference between um, uh, fact and, uh, uh, what, do you, what did you call it? Uh, the narrative? Otherwise. Narrative, yeah, the narrative. And I thought, that, that was something that caught my attention because it was something that's been going through my head. You mentioned several things throughout that video, 
that uh, have been kind of puzzling through my mind for a period of time uh, because I find that uh, we have basically in Western society kind of poo-pooed the idea of emotionalism and uh, basically kind of hung all of our tiles on the rational side. But you did mention in your discussion that uh, our mind tries to make sense of things and it creates this narrative or a whole system of rationale behind anything that goes on around it. But we're going through experience and I find that most of everything that we do has a foundation in emotion. It, it, no matter how much you do any kind of re uh, reasoning, you still have to reduce it down back to the foundational I want. Yeah. If you don't want, if you don't have that emotional drive to begin with, all the reasoning in the world, any kind of constructs that you build, don't really, how do you say, grab you. They won't push you. They won't direct you. They won't make you move forward if you don't want it. It's just like life. People check out because they don't want it. So, and and then and then we come into the other aspect of things, so the emotion and uh, reason. Emotion is the Kickstarter, and then we start to build all these systems so that we can remember things, so that we can understand them and build some sort of sense to them. And then we can also modify our emotions via reason as well. So I thought, well, the narrative, that, that there, there's something very powerful about the narrative to say, if, even if you're starting down from the point, especially if you're starting down from the point of I want True. So, how do you stand on that aspect of things? When I mean, I I'm not advocating emotionalism. Okay. Uh, obviously not. But a lot of people deny the emotional side of themselves, and I find there's a kind of a a dichotomy. People are fighting uh, themselves and don't really. We don't, we don't get a lot of training in the emotional realm, do we? No, and actually that. That's one thing that kind of um, frustrates me a little bit when I start talking to people who want to talk about logic and reason as, you know, like, you know, they, you know, portray themselves as, well, I'm logical, I'm reasonable, I don't let, you know, I don't let emotion rule me at all, and, and yada, 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 and I find that to be, just to be blunt, I find it to be a load of bullshit because not just from my experience, but also if you take a psychology course or if you happen to just study human beings for a decent period of time, and it doesn't even have to be that long, like just watch people for a week and you begin to realize that, no, we're not rational. Even the most scientific of us or the most logical of us still end up getting ruled by or end up doing things that aren't really logical or rational at all, and they only rationalize it later on, after the fact. We are beings who are capable of rationality. We can be taught rationality and we can be taught the laws of logic and how to use logic in order to, you know, achieve certain ends or to be able to figure things out. But that's my point. The fact that you have to be taught this means that while you are capable of it, it isn't something that's inherent in you. In other words, if I'm going to be putting it more bluntly, no one taught you, you know, how to breathe. No one taught you how to, you know, how to pop a squat, how to, you know, how to take a leap. No one, these are things that... I mean, they taught you the, the um, proper ways to do it. Like, oh, you need to go to, to you need to use the toilet. Don't just simply, you know, piss on yourself or you know, <laughs> in your clothes or whatever. Like, it's, it's, <laughs> right. But the, the general natural function of it, you already have. How to play games? It's stuff like you know, just simply messing with objects and fooling around with them. You kind of figure that out on yourself as you go on. You know, using your innate instincts, which get more and more developed as you grow up. It gets refined through experience by other people teaching you, but the basic mechanics of it is something that you already had yourself. Rationality and, you know, using logic and reason to be able to figure things out, yeah, there's some basic building blocks in there with us, but to actually just be rational 100% of the time or to be logical, no. Nah. We're not really, I mean, it's something that we have to be trained to do. And many times we end up fooling ourselves thinking that, oh, I, I, I was, that was a rational decision. But you're rationalizing it afterwards. And I'm not just simply saying that um, as somebody who's like, you know, like let's say you see somebody doing something that you disapprove of. And you're just basically saying, you only, you, you only 
you're just rationalizing that to me because of look good. Now I'm not going that I'm not going that route. I'm just simply saying from a very basic standpoint of how the mind works, many times your body reacts or you react and you do something instinctually and your mind tricks you into thinking that you rationalized it first and then did the action. There have actually been some tests done where the mind the part of the mind that deals with logic and reason doesn't actually activate until after you've done something. It's like yeah, I've, 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 I've and if you, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. I just want to finish this off. No, um, that's okay. Um, and when you consider, um, if I decide to throw the martial artist side of things in here, there's that whole thing of the mind of no mind that you know people like Musashi were trying to reach. That point where you just react without mm. thinking, with the proper response to an attack or a situation where it's not conscious thought that drives the proper movement. Well, in, if you're trying to reach that particular state, right there you're trying to tap a certain part of the brain that doesn't rationalize but just does things. And it does things on reaction basically for its own needs or own survival. So that is showing that right there you've got something that in you that is not rational and doesn't respond rationally to anything. It responds instinctually and or it responds emotionally. And rather than deny that, that this is an aspect of humanity or trying to make it a negative thing, we should basically try to marry the two. We should, we should realize that, yes, many times it is important to be rational and logical. But at the same time, we can't deny the emotional sides of ourselves, and we need to learn how to make them work for us rather than against us or to stop fighting against our emotional sides. So, yeah, yeah. yeah agreed. The, the, there was something else that uh, it's kind of interesting. Thinking about music, I remember. Uh, I don't know if you're familiar with Precambrian Lullaby, Kevin. Mm -hmm. uh, he he uh, had posted a video asking, "What is your favorite tune, musical tune, and why?" And I thought that was really interesting because it got me into digging into the idea of music. What is it that really makes you like a piece of music? A lot of people come up with kind of rationalizations and say, oh, because the lyrics or, or because the music is complex or it's this kind of instrument or all this kind of stuff and everything. And I thought about it for a bit. I said, you know, I like a piece of music first because the sound just goes directly and appeals to me. Right from the beginning is just the sound of it. Yeah. It makes me happy, it makes me move, whatever it is, it's something that seems to be very, very direct. It just doesn't go through the rational faculty. It goes right directly to the emotional center, it seems like. Then afterwards, if I've got that, then I can take the lyrics and the music and the sound and everything, and I can rationalize and justify everything about it. But the thing I found interesting about that is thinking about birds and that they sing. <laughs> they, they get... They got music as a form of communication. And I thought, that's really interesting, you know. They're in a three-dimensional world that requires them to react really quickly. Maybe there's something to that. Maybe there's something to the ability to directly go straight to the emotions and do that kind of thing you're talking about, that no-mind uh, sort of approach to, uh, to doing any kind of instant reaction. Yeah, it's... It's something that I could say as someone who's had to depend on it a couple of times. It can come in handy, <laughs> you know. When you just, um, I could, just to tell a kind of funny story, and I don't know if I've ever related it on YouTube before. Um, there, this was when I was like, how old was I? Maybe 19, 20 years old. Um, um, I was at a pizzeria and waiting for the pot, um, the pizza pie to come in. And I said, you know what, fuck it, there's a Street Fighter machine there. I, even back then, I was crazy about fighting games. I mean, when Street Fighter 2 came out, it ended my life. So, um, <laughs> you know, while I'm waiting for um, the pizza pie to get done, this was back when you could still find arcade machines in pizza areas. You know, I said, figured, let me just put my 25 cents in and play a few rounds. So as I'm playing, I see this dude who every now and then, I don't know if you've ever met individuals like this who just antagonize you for no reason. They don't necessarily do anything, but they always make it seem like they might start something. Like you go by and they give you dirty looks or they say, you're a what's up, little shorty. Or they, just, they just do things which make you feel like, okay, something's about to happen. He's going to do something. Like, it, 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 it never happens. So what do you mean? You mean the game or, or, or a person? No, an actual oh, yeah. person. So oh, yeah? he happened to walk past the pizzeria. I could see him through the window. Like, you know, 
Well, you know, most stores like this, the storefront, they got that huge freaking window on the side. So I'm playing my game, and I happen to notice him walking up the hill, you know, because the street was on an incline. He's walking up, and he happens to notice me, and he's kind of, he just looks at me and gives me this look like that. And I'm like, not again. And I'm thinking, okay, this is it. He's going to start something. He's, he's going to start something. Just be ready for it. So I'm still playing my game. I'm looking at the screen and everything, and I can suddenly feel. I mean, it was weird. I didn't. He didn't. I didn't feel his hands on me or anything, but I could kind of like just feel somebody coming up from behind, about to put me in a headlock. And I swear this happened. Okay, I'm not saying this to like you know to my own or anything. This is exactly what happened. Before the guy's hands could fully come like that to put me in the headlock, I just stopped, elbowed the dude grabbed his arm, spun around him, slammed his head down on the screen, and basically chicken-winged him like that, and I was about to pop his shoulder and his elbow when I realized it was my friend. <laughs> <laughs> it was one of my friends who um, also happened to have been taking martial arts at the time, and he was always trying to, like, get me to join his particular school, but I didn't really like the teacher of his school because I felt he was a bit of a quack. But that's another story in and of itself. That's just, like, something that has nothing to do with this. But he was just like, ow, ow, what the fuck, ow. <laughs> and I'm like, oh my god, I'm sorry. You know, I, like, I thought you were someone else, I'm sorry. And he freaked out like, the first few seconds, and then after that, it just turned into wonder. Like, he's like, how did you do that? And I'm like, I don't know. <laughs> I, was like, oh, I don't know. So like, That's about the best answer you could give. I don't know. It's like I just I, you were there and I saw you were there and I just reacted. I couldn't tell you how I did it. I just did it. And I noticed from then on he never told me to join it. Like he never bothered me to join the school again because I guess I proved that I, I could handle things on my own. But that I think is probably one of the best examples I can give of being able to react without thinking about it. I mean it wasn't like, oh my god, there's someone behind behind me. Okay, here's my game plan. No, it was, um, yeah. I just reacted to what came at me. And this is something that martial artists try to drill all the time. They try to drill certain reactions in themselves. That's why they keep repeating the same drills over and over again. So that when they're in a situation, their body will just react, like, without thinking. You know, whatever unconscious part of your mind governs that, it knows, oh, do this. You know, you don't have to think, okay, when he does this, because when you're trying to think about it, you get hit. Um... It's like, okay, yesterday, um, I don't know if you noticed, some people have already put up, um, already seen it, my video where I showed off that one little sparring match I did with that friend of mine. Um, while I'm not particularly, I'm not like completely satisfied with my performance because I'm seeing so many chances I could have had to come at him diagonally and take advantage of an open angle, um, I, was exact, I was pleased, however, with the fact that I always instinctually was able to pop his hands, like, all I knew was, okay, my general strategy is when he makes a move, go for his hands and arms. That was my plan because I didn't know how, I, this was my first time fighting him, so I had no idea what he was going to be like, so I'm like, play it safe, go for his arms. That was the extent of my thinking and strategy. How I was going to hit his arms, I didn't know. I wasn't going to be like, okay, when he does this, I'm going to do this. When he does this, I'm going to, no, it was just like, okay, go for his hands. And most of the time, when he did a move, I was able to just pop there's several times, if you watch the video, there are times where I didn't even, you know, because I'm narrating it and I'm pointing out, okay, I got his hands there, I got his hands there. But there's several other times I get his hands. It happened so fast, I didn't even notice it while I was narrating it. I only noticed it after the fact, after I uploaded the video. I'm like, holy shit, I got him there. I got him there too. Like, it was, I kept popping. And I noticed this happened because every time he made a move, I just instinctively reacted. I didn't um, think, go there. I didn't think, okay, this is what, it was just pop pop, it, it, it just happened because that's a move that I drilled. So in that one sense, yeah, you, I guess this is a strike against rationalizing things. When you're in a fight, you don't want to rationalize anything. You just want to be able to react instinctually. However, the flip side of just reacting instinctually or emotionally to something is when you start dealing with things such as, you know, ethics, philosophy, when you're trying to figure something out, now you got to put your emotions aside because at this point you're trying to do things without bias. And whatever may please you emotionally or whatever may please you, um, you know, in an instinctual level may not be correct. Unfortunately, this is where your mind starts to play tricks on you into making you think that, no, this is correct. And this is where I start talking about the whole connecting the dots thing. And this is how, 
This is how, at least in my point of view, this is how um, a lot of things like coming up with conspiracy theories or coming up with wacky ideological, you know, philosophies start to come into play where it makes no sense in real life, but they connected things in their life a certain way so that to them, no, this makes total sense. This is exactly the way the world works. No, it doesn't. <laughs> but that's the, they're going by narrative. They're going by what their mind told them. I find that funny, you know. What's I, I keep wondering about what's going on through that sort of mentality, that conspiracy theory mentality. When I look at things, I try to go out and I try to see things from from personal experience. I don't know if that makes a lot of sense to you, but I find that most of the stuff that, that goes on in my in, in existence goes from a personal experience sort of thing. I mean, that's what we're made of. If you think of your your life, it's built of experience and interpretation. So you're going out there, and these people come up with these kind of, again, this connecting the dots thing. And it really, I used to get into some discussions with uh, this this person who I got a little bit nervous about because he, he starts talking about this certain aspect of a conspiracy, and I can't remember exactly what it was, but I started to question him. And I started to get the impression he was starting to think, oh, I must be a plant from one of those people who are, <laughs> who are in the conspiracy <laughs> to try to uh, hide it or something like that. It, it kind of it makes you a little bit nervous of how far a person can go with that sort of thing to just obliterate everything, every relationship that could be possible to the person in favor of the conspiracy. There's like some sort of importance to that thing that is... Uh, it, 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 it makes up his life and he has to defend it for some reason. But for me, when I look at things and I see, well, these people do things, again, look, what I said the other day, the other day uh, everybody does things because they think it's the right thing to do. Yeah. And I can't think of a single instance where anybody doesn't do that sort of thing. But for people to be able to get together on the level of a conspiracy and keep that going for any extended period of time is rather bizarre. Not only that, but there's also the aspect that sooner or later each person involved in the conspiracy is going to start to get suspicious about the other person who's supposed to be involved in it. I can't see it holding together. Okay, um, okay. before I answer you, I just want to say this. I don't know if they're left in the room, but I'm noticing like viewers like rising and falling constantly. Um, Donovan Alexander asked, um, what are we talking about today? Um, generally, we're just shooting the breeze. Um, it's mostly going to be on philosophical and possibly political topics, but generally we're just kind of shooting the shit. We didn't really set a specific topic. Um, hopefully that will not um, put some of you guys off who wanted like a specific topic, but this is generally, I noticed that when, I, uh, when Richard is responding to any one of my videos, it's mostly my philosophical or political ones. So that's pretty <laughs> much where... Um, the topics are going to lead. I'm not, this isn't going to be a sword video. Thank you. This isn't going to be a, a sword video. This isn't going to be a, um, you know, on video games and all that type of stuff. It's just going to be, you know, on, you know, a topic that we have to share, which is mostly, you know, philosophical and political type stuff. So, anyway, to go on with what you were saying, Richard, um, about people who just, like, caught up in that, you know, whether theory or and stuff like that, and the fact that they feel that they need to defend it. I know for a long time when I was younger, it kind of confused the hell out of me that, you know, you would, because I was naive, you know, you would, um, you'd come to somebody with something that you researched, a particular fact, and you tell it to them, and they just angrily come back at you, like, that's not true, and it's like, no, nah, it is, like, look at this, it's like, like okay, um, back in college when I was notorious for, <laughs> my nickname was the Crossbreaker, three guesses as to why. Um, back in, in um, college, I was, you know, I used to debate with Christian guys a lot, and I remember this one guy was so angry with me because I happened to have mentioned, you know, the way you guys believe the crucifix happened could never have happened that way. Jesus could never have been on the cross the way you guys describe it. He was like, what are you talking about? Like, if everyone, why, everyone, there's eyewitnesses. You don't have any real eyewitness accounts. Your gospels were all written by people at least hundreds of years after the guy even lived. So it's not an eyewitness account. And then second of all, physically, I mean, just the laws of physics dictate that the way you guys described in the hang on there couldn't have happened. So, I mean, this guy was getting mad, like red in the face mad. And he was like, what proof do you have? It's, okay, look, just because you happen to see pictures and, you know, figurines of him on the cross doesn't mean that that's exactly how it happened. Because do you know what type of nails these guys used in order, you know, to 
the, the basic nails I use to do work. He's like, oh, so the nails, they're not exactly like roofing, you know, they, they're not like, you know, the general nails that you, you nail sheetrock with. Have you ever seen them? They look like, like railroad spikes, okay? They're big, thick, iron railroad type spikes. And you guys believe that he was nailed through the hand. There is no bone structure over here that will support a regular nail, let alone something so big and thick that when you put it through here, it pretty much destroys the hand. The guy's just going to fall right through. So then he gave me the BS um, line that I tended to hear from people at the time and still hear every now and then. Oh, no, I know we, we, we draw it as the hand symbolically, but it really went through the wrist. I said, again, physics. Come on, man. The, the thing was so freaking thick, it would have split this. He's still going to fall through. You would need some type of ropes or something to keep him up, which if you look at, you know, descriptions of um, Roman um, crucifixions, that make, that's what they did. It made more sense. The way you guys describe it, it could never happen that way. He was pretty pissed off. So, but and, <laughs> a post. Well, okay, I know some people saying the post thing, but again, the it doesn't change. It wouldn't use as much wood, but it's still busting through the bones and the flesh. You need more support than just a freaking thick ass railroad spike of a nail. <laughs> Yeah, through the wrist part, yeah, but it will split it. The arm, maybe, but now we're going away from the hands and wrists. Now you're, now you're talking forearms, <laughs> which I don't know if there was any evidence of it going through the forearms. Oh, yeah. But the point I'm trying to make is that when I, it's like something that anybody with no emotional investment in that wouldn't have a problem with. Um, yeah. It would be like... Oh, oh yeah, they'll be like, yeah, that's fascinating. Like, like you know, like for instance, MythBusters of um shows. People watch MythBusters and how they bust up myths all the time that we really don't have too much emotion to stake in. And we watch them yeah. go, oh, well, that's pretty cool. Wow, I guess that myth. Oh, that myth is proven. That that's not a myth. Or that we're just watching you know, with a sense of entertainment or a sense of interest. Like that's interesting. But as soon as you touch on something that they happen to have some type of emotional stake in, they will blow the fuck up, even though facts are facts. And it used to blow my mind when I was younger. Like, what the hell is your problem? This is a simple. I mean, come on. It's like, it's like learning math. I don't get mad because somebody proved to me that two plus three is five. What the hell is your problem? <laughs> but it wasn't until I got older that I realized that it is something of a self-defense mechanism to lash back at something that you happen to base a lot your life on. And part yeah. of the reason for that is because again, your mind does frame a certain narrative around the world around uh, uh, around you. It sets up a certain framework, and you have to live and die by that framework. In some ways, quite literally, the way we look at the world right now with our sense of colors and sights and sounds, we think this is the scope of all that is, and we function and survive based on that information that our brain receives from the organs that give us our senses. However, our organs are flawed. The color scheme that we see is not the, the entire spectrum of the light spectrum. Do not, you, there's tons more, uh, there's a much bigger field of colors and lights and sensations that our eyes just cannot pick up. Um, same thing with sounds. There's a lot that we just cannot consciously hear. Other animals can pick it up just fine. You know, like, you know, when you're in the middle of the night at 3 o'clock in the morning and your cat suddenly does one of these. <laughs> and then the next thing you know, you're up with a freaking shotgun until, like, you know, 5 and 3 and 6 o'clock in the morning wondering what the hell did the <laughs> We don't pick up on these things. We don't hear these things. We don't see these things. They're out there, but they're not part of our framework. However, we, the framework we do have is what we use to survive. Well, it's not just limited to our senses. It also goes to the pattern recognition um, skills that our brain gives us. Our, our brains are basically made for trying to assess the situation quickly so that we would know whether we can make fight or we can fight or just take the hell off, fight or flight. And because of that, you need to be able to like analyze the situation immediately and compartmentalize whatever it is that you happen to be experiencing, seeing, hearing, tasting, whatever. Yeah. And therefore, you're basically like, like this is not just going to be on like just basic stuff of hmm, does this seem like poison? I think it's it smells kind of weird. I don't trust it. You don't have time to think about it for five minutes. You know, especially if you food you have around, you have to quickly assess. Well, the same thing happens with our pattern recognition skills, it, not just with physical stuff and matter, but also with things we hear, things we experience, things that people tell us. 
And when we form that pattern, and that pattern seems to have worked for us, it gets really hard to move away from it. So yeah. let's say you've been living a life that basically told you, that gave you a pattern of, you know, some type of superstitious stuff. Let's say you happen to, you per really believe that this bottle cap saved your life whenever you walk down a dark alley. And every time you put it in your pocket, you walk through, you were safe. You will freak the hell out if that bottle cap is not in your pocket one day. And you have to walk through that freaking alley. Never mind the fact that statistically it has nothing to do with the bottle cap, but that's what your mind trained you to do. You formed a pattern. You formed an oh, area. That's what your mind told you. That's that you that's the pattern you recognize. It's the same thing with political ideologies, where people only see what they want to see with certain politics. And no matter how many facts you throw at them, well, their life experience told them, well, no. It's um to give you another example, though, it's not that great an example because later on it turned out the guy was just trying to see what, I, what answer I'd come up with. Um, oh. I um, posted up, this was like Facebook somewhere. Um, there's this thing going around that basically is showing how in Denmark, people over there at McDonald's, the average salary there is $45,000 a year. $45, a year. <clears throat> yeah, I heard that one. I that one. And it's actually true. So I happened to have posted that up, and somebody came back saying, oh, that's because of inflation. That's the real reason. I mean, this is not an excuse for – they were like saying you shouldn't raise minimum wage because it's only, if you do that, it's going to cause inflation, which is bullshit. It's not. And I was like – and that, that was from an early argument. I'm like, it's not true, but I don't really have time to get into it right now. And then when I posted up the Mickey D's thing, he's like, thanks for proving my point that it would cause inflation because Denmark – they have a higher cost of living than we do here in the U.S. And he posted up a website showing the actual costs of living in Denmark as compared to the U.S. So I looked at the link, and then I had to go back. Did you bother actually reading the site? Because, yeah, their cost of living is higher by, on average, about maybe 50% more. The only thing that was double our, say, our cost of living was restaurant prices, and people aren't going to be going to restaurants every freaking day unless they got millions of dollars and can't freaking cook or, you know, don't have a maid at home or something. I'm looking at the average prices. They're, like, you know, like 27% higher, 37% higher. And I'm like, let's do the math. Let's bring these prices down to U.S. prices and bring their salary down to the U.S. salary. They still make more! <laughs> <laughs> this has nothing to do with inflation. The reason why these guys are getting paid more isn't because of cost of living. It's because the guys have better business ethics than we do. You proved my argument. You didn't prove yours with this one. <laughs> and the guy kept going, well, you you know, he kept pushing the issue and kept saying that, no, you, you know, you're wrong. And, and you're trying to bring this stuff here. And he basically saying that, you know, we already have like a socialist um, oligarchy here in the U.S. I'm like, there's a socialist oligarchy in the U.S.? A socialist <laughs> <laughs> I wouldn't argue with an oligarchy, but a socialist one. And this is also what reminds me of this whole narrative. You got people in this country right now who are still stupid enough to think that somehow we're being taken over with socialism, while at the same time we're arguing over trying to save net neutrality. Does this sound like something that a socialist country would have to worry about? <laughs> <laughs> a place where people <laughs> A country where you still don't have universal health care and you're worried about socialism taking over. It's like this is the type of stuff like you, the facts prove otherwise. And this has nothing to do with whether by, and this is something else that really gets people. When I start getting into these arguments, they start thinking that I'm like, so you're trying to say that capitalism is evil and all that. Is that no, did that enter the conversation? This is not a conversation about what is a better system. This has to do with what is the reality of the situation. You claim this place was one thing when it's not. You're pointing at the cat and calling it a freaking um, Boston Terrier. That's not what it is. I'm telling you it's a cat. Whether or not a cat is better than a Boston Terrier or not did not enter the conversation yet. My point is, when you're calling one thing, it's actually another. And that's, again, the whole narrative thing. There are some people who, because of the narrative that their mind told them, the country we're living in is now turning into a socialist dictatorship. That's when... <laughs> With people arguing <laughs> for the abuses of corporations, I really don't freaking see how it could possibly be a socialist takeover. <laughs> if it was a socialist takeover, corporations would be losing power, not gaining more. Their government would be more like a like a, 
national socialist sort of uh, system, uh, Nazi, fascist sort of a system, when, it, when the, the corporations start uh, getting the kind of power that they do. Uh, that was the idea of uh, fashion, if I'm not mistaken, that the, uh, the, com the companies were all privately owned, but it was the government that controlled everything about them. Yeah. Although you could say the reverse was true in in the United States, it seems to be that the uh, government is a lot is a, is a lot of uh, controlling manipulators and uh, infiltrating, like you were talking about, uh, in the government. Uh, net net neutrality. The person who's in the F, it was the FCC or the FFC, the FCC, FCC. who's uh, trying to turn things in a certain way in favor of the corporations, for instance. Yeah, and it's like it's things like that where if you point it out to people. They'll either say that you're lying, or they'll completely ignore it and stick with the story that they've either been given or formed themselves. You may have noticed this. They'll repeat the same thing over and over, and you're like, you'll disprove it, and they'll completely ignore what you just said. So you know, you could, for instance, like you know, like just to think for another thing, like, well, you know, Obama is mostly socialist. He got most of his money from Wall Street. Yeah, but he's doing a socialist takeover. Look what he did to um with this stupid healthcare system of his. Yeah, but it favors the you know it actually favors the healthcare industry. And in fact, he even took out the whole clause for a government option. So I don't see what you're talking about here. It, in fact, it just simply gives the healthcare industry more um more customers. It's based off a Republican bill. How is this a socialist takeover? Well, he's still a socialist. <laughs> Can you give me any other examples? Has he, um, for instance, um, has he, for instance, found ways to increase the amount of um, what you would call it? Um, my brain just suddenly shut down. Has he increased the amount of welfare revenue to people? Because that would be a socialist idea. Did he do that? <laughs> well, no, that's not the point. Besides, welfare is bad. And anyway, this is a socialist. You didn't answer my freaking question. Did he do like you have to start like like what socialist things has he done? Has he broken up monopolies? Has he gained more um like he's given tons more power, you know, ripped it from corporations and put the money back into the public's hands? Has he I mean, hell, the, the closest thing I would call something that was maybe a socialist move was when he got his hands on General Motors and made the government run it for a while. But he put in the clause that once they paid back the money, they were free to do whatever the hell they wanted. And the funny thing is, when the government took over, one of the first things they told them to do was fire a bunch of freaking workers to make them more marketable. Does that sound like a socialist idea to you? <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah. Well, this, one of the things they, that I find sometimes, uh, getting back to another thing you were talking about, uh, the, uh, the, 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 the theists... A lot of times they bring up that idea that uh, the, the, their their whole their whole system, their whole idea seems to we're special. You know, they got this sort of idea we're special. And one of the things that makes us special and separate from all the other animals is our rational faculty. And yet they get so emotionally invested in what they're doing. So that aspect of it kind of works against the other as well. Uh, again, you, you just keep coming up against this tendency to repeat and repeat and repeat their narrative as if repeating it is going to make it real and, and solid and, and more, I don't know, uh, touchable in, in, in their whole thinking. Yeah, and I think part of the reason why they repeat it is because, well, for one, it's a defense mechanism. You know, it's like they can't, they have to drown out what's shattering their work. Um, the other thing is, quite frankly, think about it when you freeze up when you're in a situation that you don't know how to deal with it. Definitely, so might be question crown closing through. Um, think about like, okay, let's say you're driving. You're used to driving at, you know, you're a modest driver, 55 to 60 miles per hour. Okay, just keep it down then. You're going around like, um, you know, just general speeds, and then all of a sudden, you know, and, and, and you're used to driving at a decent commute. Nothing ever happens. Nothing crazy ever happens. So your body is used to dealing with. Decent traffic, nothing crazy, and all of a sudden a Mack truck starts rolling in front of you. <laughs> You're like, what the fuck? You know, you, you all of a sudden you freak the hell out, right? People who are like, they got their mind prepared for that, they got some type of, they, it's part of their framework to do that, 
they will instinctively, they won't think about, okay, let me do this. They'll instinctively do the next move that they got. Okay. Um, if, however, you don't have a frame of reference to work with that, if something new in the world and your natural instinct is to, like, just simply cruise along or whatever, you're going to freeze. Or you might, like, Maybe you might slam on the brakes because you know that's what, that's the only other thing you got, or you might just simply freeze up because you you just lock up. You're stuck in your brain, stuck in a loop. I notice that sometimes happens to people even in debates when they suddenly hit with stuff that they don't know how to deal with it. So they just repeat the same damn thing over and over again, hoping that somehow it works. And part of the other reason why they keep repeating it over and over again is because to them it's like what they said was the ultimate end all to be all. Um, like, <laughs> um, the guy who I was going against again in the sword, um, the sword fight, his main move is snap cut. Okay, yeah. that is the answer to that. problems. Snap cut. Now, if I suddenly slip past the snap cut and just go in and I hack his arms, oh, snap cut. He doesn't know anything else. It's just like I just shattered his world. New information has come in which has invalidated it, and instead yeah. of simply going. I need to come up with something new. I need to change this up. No, right now his survival instincts in his mind, the narrative, all it has is snap cut. That's all you got. So it just, you know, it loses. Um, the same thing happens in debates sometimes. Um, when you come up with really dumb arguments of, you know, such as, well, the rich create jobs. They, they don't create jobs. They give them the revenue in order to keep the business going. In fact, people create their own jobs all the time. You know, like, for instance, when the whole vaporizer craze started popping up, tons of people, without some corporations stepping in, decided to start making their own vaping juices and went online on the Internet and instantly started making jobs for their own selves and for other people who were willing to sell um, stuff on the Internet. So they created yeah. a job. And then other people helped them to expand more by giving them more money to expand, which created more jobs. It's a cyclical system. It isn't just these rich guys. Yeah. Yeah. But, but, but they're the ones who are the company, so they create the jobs. I just told you that that wasn't true. They're stuck in the narrative. That's what they know. It's, it, yeah. it, it's all that. And to them, it's like the ultimate answer. And I see it happen all the time. Um, one more thing, and I'll leave it back to you again. Like, not to dig up old graves here. But it was like, what, two years ago? Maybe one year ago? When, um, when Skeptical Heretic had that live debate with, um, what the hell is his name? Because he went by so many freaking names on YouTube that I lost track of all of them. Uh, <laughs> I'm terrible with names. <laughs> I completely forgot this guy. Uh, whatever. He was, he was having a live debate with somebody over the whole race realism issue. And it was painful to watch because Skep just kept hitting with facts over and over again about how, basically the guy came up with a statement. Skep would destroy that argument, and then the guy would try to repeat it in a different way. And he's like, no, I already know. The, the facts do not support that. And then he finally just hit him with a straight-up question. Can you, like, he basically hit him with this whole point of, can you come up with anything to disprove what I just said? Do you have any other thing to support it? And all the dude could do was stutter. And it was really, it's, and it was painful to watch because it's like the guy, because he was stuck on a certain narrative, all these other facts out there he never studied, never researched, and when it was told to him, he couldn't even accept it, but at the same time he had no answer for it. All he could do was just repeat the same thing over and over again. He may have said it in different words, but it was just basically the same story he was telling over and over because he didn't have facts at that point. All he had was his narrative. All he had was this, you know, his view of how things work. And that can't help you when you're trying to actually get to the quote-unquote truth. You need more than just a narrative. You actually need evidence to support what it is you're saying. And that mean, and in order to do that, you have to put your emotional side in check because sometimes you'll find out something you really don't want to know. Yeah, that's the that's the issue, isn't it? Want again, it comes back to that. Uh, but I find myself more of the type that's going to sit back and try to listen to the arguments. I kind of think I consider myself to be somewhat of a, a, a juvenile sort of approach uh, when it comes to uh, figuring things out and understanding things. And I don't mean that in a self-deprecating way. Uh, I just find a lot of people, there are people out there who will come at you with, with 
I've seen other people put videos up, and I've seen comments uh, responding to them. Oh, that's an old argument. Oh, you know, that's over and done with. It's, you know, and I keep on thinking, well, wait a minute. There are lots of other people that are listening to these videos and watching them and learning from them who are not necessarily on the same plane or context of knowledge that that other person might be. So why do they keep coming up with this sort of, oh, that's old shit. What are you doing? What are you rehashing that stuff for? I don't understand that at all. You know, I think... All the levels of knowledge should be put out there for a lot of different people because there's a lot of different people of many, many different stages. So it gets a little bit frustrating to see that sort of approach where they're ridiculing other people for that. Yeah, I agree. Um, a lot of people have to realize that sometimes they're not necessarily on the same level as them. And this is not the, you know, two people's horns like saying, that, I'm on such a level. Trust me, there's people like way past you. So before you start talking about like, Lifting up your belt like, yeah, I'm the shit. There's some stupid <laughs> stuff falling further down the road. So, you know. Well, that's the opposite end of it, isn't it? The person who thinks they're at the top and this is the plateau and I'm the be-all be and end-all and nothing you can say is ever going to destroy anything that I have to say. Yeah, exactly. And then meanwhile, somebody else got something like an atomic bomb's worth of information to um, throw at you. Um, so you do have to, people have to realize that all levels of knowledge that happens to be out there at the point at that point, it has to still be on display. Just because you no longer need to um, to hear the basics doesn't mean that somebody else can't take advantage of it. Somebody else might still need to hear that information. And who knows, you might need a review. It happens. Um, yeah, exactly. at the same time, and I'm very strong proponent of that particular thing, too, to review things all the time, always be in review. Yeah, you have to be willing to um, humble yourself sometimes and go back to see if there's something that you might have screwed up. Though, yeah, on the exactly. that, there are some people who, because they don't know the higher end of knowledge and stuff, they'll then criticize what they don't understand. I've seen like many yes. times where it's like they, they'll say some really dumb stuff like, so this, like, martial arts are here this all the time. That move won't work. Okay. And if I'm hearing it from another martial artist who actually has some experience, then I want to hear what they have to say. Because then it's like, okay, why do you think from your experience it wouldn't work? And I would get to hear something interesting, probably something from a different point of view that, or a different angle that made me reconsider, you know, what the topic is. Hi, hey, Ben. Hi. Hi. <laughs> My son. Um, but if I'm hearing it from somebody who's never even bothered to enter any type of martial arts gym, never bothered getting into the ring, sparring with anybody, then I really don't want to hear what the hell they have to say. Because it's like, okay, for instance, in fact, this happened yesterday. I was showing off, um, to, the, to the same guy, I was um, showing him some of the basic Bagua palm movements, because he happens to know a little bit of Salat, which I, I love seeing Salat in action. It was actually a pleasure to actually be in front of somebody who knew some Salat and he was showing me some joint locks and stuff. I'm like, this is awesome. But he wanted to know what I did, so I was showing him some of the basic Bagua Palm movements that I knew. And he stopped me at one point and said, well, why did you do that spin? I mean, you're turning your back to your opponent, which is a line I keep hearing all the time. For anybody right now listening to this who has any interest in martial arts right whatsoever and has either heard that line or like saying that line, Please shut up. You don't really know what you're talking about when you keep talking about you're turning your back to them because if you've ever thrown anyone, you've turned your back to them. Mm -hmm. If you have ever done a basic judo style throw, where you grab their arm and do this to toss them, what the fuck do you think you just did? You turned your back. My little story, my just along those lines. My my uh, younger brother and I took taekwondo when we were kids. And he did this beautiful move, and what he basically did was he lifted his foot, and he turned his back to me, and that was like a lure. <laughs> <laughs> so I move in, and he puts his foot up, and I'm stuck right in the solar plexus on the end of his foot. <laughs> he was scared he <laughs> killed me, but yeah, there's a lot of different maneuvers I could imagine you'd use that would be just like that almost like a lure. Again, the issue with flipping somebody and having the back to you, yeah. Uh, I don't understand why they go off that way. Right, but and then actually, I ended up showing that to the dude. Like, you was saying that, in fact, the way he said that you just turned your back. 
I just rolled my eyes and I went, just do something. So he kind of threw a punch and I just parried, spun around. And when I did the spun around, he was in a joint lock all of a sudden. I said, did you notice what I just did? I turned my back and now you're in a joint lock. He said, oh, right. I'm like, yeah. And I'm thinking to myself, you're a martial artist yourself. Now, I can't fall. This is the other problem with when it comes to knowledge that isn't necessarily layman's knowledge. They have a point. I mean, in a fight, you don't want to turn your back to your opponent. You know, because you want to be able to see where they are at all times. This is just basic yeah. fighting 101. Yeah. If you're like this, and I decide to do this for a second, I'm going to turn around and either have a fist in my face or an axe upside my head or whatever the hell it is that you're going to hit me with. I need to, you know, see where the hell you are. This is basic stuff. But there are certain maneuvers that end up making you put yourself in a position that doesn't look advantageous. Uh -huh. But it only looks disadvantageous out of context. And yeah. that where basic knowledge usually just simply functions as is in any subject. Higher end stuff, mid level stuff, you need context in order to make it work. And it's the context that a lot of people lack when it comes time to looking at stuff that they may not necessarily understand. Mm -hmm. Even the experts, um, and this kind of leads me a little bit into the questions here. Um, I want to quickly hurry up into this and I'll finish what I was saying. Um, Third Eye, Seventh Dimension had asked you, was that Shrek in your background? Which I'm not <laughs> sure it is. Yes. <laughs> I'm a big animation fan. <laughs> and um, I, love all, I love all the Pixar and all the rest of that stuff. <laughs> and also, I have to answer his question now because when I'm talking about turning my back, he happened to have mentioned Scholagrim because Scholagrim is a big proponent at not turning your back or doing spinning moves against your opponent. Scholagrim, however, has a frame of reference to work with on this because his fighting style doesn't allow for any of that nonsense to go on, at least out of context. However, he doesn't have the context of my style and how it trains. So because of that, him seeing me suddenly do a weird twisty move, he only has his frame of reference to work with. And this, once again, kind of goes right back to the whole narrative argument. He has his own frame of reference to work with. And with his frame of, work, uh, of reference with martial arts, spinny type moves just don't work. They just don't. In my world, there is a time and place for them. There's a small time and place for them, but there's a time and place for them. I showed one example in one of my older, um, one of my fairly recent videos where I showed how to properly apply a particular type of spin move. Is it something that you would want to do all the time? No. Is it something you should try to push for? No. But is it something that you can make work if you put yourself in that particular situation? Yes. This is, now I'm going more to more advanced type stuff. This is not beginner stuff. Context. It all happens in context. This is situational Stuff. This is situational information. This is situational knowledge, which higher end stuff tends to be. It only works in like specific circumstances, but when you make it work, it's magic to some people because it goes beyond basic stuff. Like to be able to, for instance, deflect somebody's blow just simply by doing this, but get their arms over here and they wonder what the hell happened. To the layman, it looks like I had super strength and superpowers. I had nothing of the sort. I just used body mechanics to make it work. And it worked in that particular situation because I was able to make that work. Yeah. Somebody, again, without that context, without that frame of reference, you have no idea how it works. So if you have, if any of you guys happen to see me doing my Bagua stuff, because I know it's a lot of you guys who train martial arts, you guys are more like what I call the hardcore, like straight line set. You practice MMA, you practice Western martial arts. They move in lines. They don't really move in circles. So suddenly you see me and I'm doing some weird stuff like this and you're like, what the hell is he doing? It looks like dancing. It looks pretty. Then I use it and suddenly it doesn't look pretty anymore and now it makes sense. Shit, why is he attacking me from over here? I he was over here a second ago. Why is it like he was here and all of a sudden I'm like, my arm is over here and this shit. I threw a punch and all of a sudden he's throwing me around this way. And then now and the thing is, when I'm doing it to you, you still can't really see what I did unless you see it in camera. And then you go, Oh, that was that twisty move. Now you have the context. Now it makes sense. So this is, like I said, that's the other side of things. On one side, the people who have the extra stuff, they shouldn't really like just look down on the people who uh, just because they still need the basic knowledge. You should still every now and then put out the basic stuff for people who don't know it. But on the other end, the people on the lower end need to understand that if they don't have the context for a certain thing and they see something that somebody who has at least some experience happens to mention, 
if you don't have that experience, maybe it's best to be quiet and figure it out first before you criticize. That's one. Of, that's one of my major pet peeves. Like somebody like Skull criticizing something, I think he has every right because yeah, he may not have my particular context of information, but he still has experience. He has a reason to say what he's saying. Or ask questions. But you know, or best ask questions. Now, but then yeah. again, this comes now. This comes down time to. No, I mean, whose context is better? Oh, I should say who's better. It's like this now you're beginning to compare narratives. This person's narrative says that this doesn't work. The other person's narrative says that it does. And now you two, if you're willing to actually come together and have a decent discussion about it, you two can come together and find out once and for all whose story makes sense. And you may come back, you may walk away from it going, both of our narratives make sense. We just didn't have the full story. And then now you guys got a new narrative that's closer to each other than before. Before you had two different ideas of the world. Then you came together and you both walk away with a new idea of the world and it's a shared one. That's the thing that's more ideal. Um, I don't know if you guys can add to that. <laughs> I don't see any text from anybody else. Oh, no, 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 no. You have to, the text is all there in the chat. It's just you and me. It's the question and answer thing. Oh, oh Q&A. Oh, okay, over here. Q&A is where people's questions are popping up. <laughs> okay. Um, Third Eye has another question if you don't have anything else to add. I don't know if you want to touch on this because I don't really know how much you know about martial arts and such. So, um... Do you want to touch on this now? No. <laughs> Do you see what the question is? Right. Is there a, a, a question up there? Um, the question, he says he doesn't mean to dominate the question place, um, but since he's on the topic of martial arts, what about engaging and utilizing kicks, elbows, and such during sparring? Do I use those in my sparring, and why or why not? Um, well, I can only speak from my experience, but when I spar with my friends, pretty much everything is fair game unless we're going slow. Um, we're not trying to kill each other, mind you, but we're trying to make things work. And if we're if we're going up against beginners, like if I'm going up against somebody who's like just starting out, then I'm not going to be throwing everything in the kitchen sink at them. I'm going to kind of keep it basic because. If you're just gonna like, if you're going up against somebody who's like, they, this is their first or second practice meet, and you're going out there and you're just gonna just steamroll them, all they've learned is, I have no skills. Yeah. That's it. That's all they've learned. They've, they've just learned that I can't defend myself one way or another. So you're gonna have to tone it down a little bit. You're like, so, you know, like I'll keep it simple. If I'm going up against somebody who doesn't really have much in the way of like basic defense. Then the first thing I'm going to do is, okay, number one, keep your hands up and learn how to intercept. Are you right-handed or left-handed? Then you probably want to have your right hand first. I know most people say you should keep your left hand first, but trust me, if you're right-handed and you're first learning how to fight, this is the hand that she's most articulate. So you're obviously going to want that one to be in the front to keep everything back. This is your club. So I'm going to know this is how you deflect and then use your club. This is your shield. This is your club. You don't really need this to be that dexterous yet. So that's your basic defense. Use this will be able to get where you want it to go because you're, you know, that's your dominant hand. This hand only needs to go out when it needs to just hit, and you don't need to use this as a scalpel to be effective. Just bam, and there you go. Now we'll go through basic drills. I'll just start coming at you, and you just use the base, and then you stick with that. But now, if you're going up against somebody else who has something under the belt, now you can play. And I deal with a group of guys that believes everything goes. To be honest, I've done elbows, I've done throws, I've done double kicks to people and stuff like that. I try to keep it down with my kicks though, because uh, I, I wear steel toe shoes, so I really have to watch it. So I tend to keep my kicks more to like hooking type kicks and tripping type kicks. If I'm wearing softer shoes or I got my feet off and I know that the guy can kind of handle it, then yeah, I might you know th um, thrust them out a little bit more. Though, on the subject of kicks. And this is something of a controversial subject, depending on who you talk to with martial arts. I don't know why I had the camera stuck on you for some reason. I, um, the whole time I had to... Um, Your camera on? Yeah, my camera was on, but I had it locked out for some reason. Um, oh. Anyway, when it comes to the subject of kicks, I... And I guess this is my narrative now. 
I'm of the school of thought that you really should keep your kicks to a minimum, and if you have to kick, keep them at waist level. Or Well, if you're really good, I guess you can kind of go chest level, but generally it's safest to keep it at waist level down. Head kicks and are not a good idea. I mean, there are some people who can pull them off. I've seen, like, like if you look at certain MMA fights, I've seen some really beautiful kicks to the head that are just, they just came out of nowhere. Bam! And the guy goes down. You just start laughing at the thing again. <laughs> Sudden fraud or whatever, but um, generally for the most part, most people, even people who've gone to like gone to like you say a martial arts school for a while, learned some taekwondo. Most people do not know how to deliver a kick without telegraphing it, and the average without, what? without telegraphing it, like knowing that the kick is coming. Oh, I see, I see. Okay, okay, okay. Yeah, makes sense. The average person when they throw a kick, they're gonna be standing here, right, and they're ready to throw the kick, and they'll do one of these. Now, I don't know how much fighting experience you have, but if you see me doing this, you know this is coming. Okay? Yeah. Few people know how to throw a kick like that. Okay? They don't. Now, granted, somebody who has some martial arts experience will probably guess the minute I shift that that leg is coming out. Like, they know, bam, that kick came out. But most people don't know how to kick like that. They just know how to do the cross leg and bam. Or if they're going to do a kick, they'll do one of these and they'll. They'll suddenly yeah. break their guard and open up and then do that. You know the foot's coming. They don't know. I've got, I've got a little something to add in here. I can't see what you're doing. I, <laughs> I, am, uh, I just have a picture of you on the on the screen right now. Oh wow. Okay. I'm sorry about that because I can. I guess my camera didn't work. But <laughs> that on your end. Anybody who saw that, hopefully you guys saw the difference between like you know throwing a kick out. Without telegraphing and throwing a kick out, like which is the average way people used to do it, they leave it wide open. And kicks are really hard to train to throw out without telegraphing, because yeah. I mean you got to it's supporting your weight. You got to learn how to shift your weight to one side and lift the leg up and then shoot it high. And the higher you make the kick, the harder it is to make it come out fast. Yeah, the low kicks can just shoot out fast. And better yet, it sometimes they can come out out of the person's point of view. Like if you're throwing something like that, like a jab to the eyes, but at the same time you're getting ready to throw a kick to their knee, they're too busy looking up. Then bam, now now they're down. Which is uh -huh. that's why I tend to say when it comes to fighting, you want to keep your kicks to a minimum and you want to keep them low, <laughs> unless you know how to snap them fast. And even then, I wouldn't suggest throwing it to the head unless you know the guy's an idiot. He's gonna get clobbered. Yeah. Now, as far as elbows. Very useful freaking weapons to have. They just are. Once you get into a clinch with somebody, knowing how to suddenly jack somebody up with an elbow, is it's a beautiful thing. And it's just that most people just know how to throw, like, if they want to do elbows, they'll do this, or they'll do that, you know, stuff like that. And there's, there's a lot more evil stuff you can do with elbows if you use your imagination. If you, like, intercept a blow, but just to give you an idea, you intercept the blow, and you trap the arms, there's your elbow. You use it as a bridge. You said, boom. Just, just cross instantly like that. And then just use this as a pivot point to back that way. While at the same time hooking with your left leg, you've just thrown them to the floor. You don't just simply have to use these bludgeons. You can use these as fine instruments. You know, hit yeah. your arms, pivot off the arms, hook under there, toss them into a... Um, a headlock that way. Now, now they're down. They lost their balance. Kick their leg out to make them fall even further. You can, you gotta, these things are nice tools, and they're not just bludgeons. People got to know how to use them. And it all has to do with not just you know thinking of the points of your arm as weapons. A lot of people who train how to fight, all they think of as their weapons is their fists, fingers maybe, elbows, knees, and feet. They don't seem to realize that the forearm is a weapon. The bicep is a weapon. The shoulder is a weapon. You gotta know how to use those things. Uh -huh. And it's just boom, you know, like just you can do it like most of the time when I'm like sparring with people, they expect me to hit them with my fist, and next thing they know, they got hit with my forearm, and it's always that weird look in their face. What the hell did you just do? Because I don't. This is not the only tool I have. You, yep. you know, it's all this. All right, <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm kind of dominating the conversation because I I, I know you don't really do martial arts, so. But no, I, I 
I have, I have no issues with uh, discussing these things. Is uh, well, if you're talking about martial arts, we, we were talking before about uh, going through uh, the process of uh, the mindless uh, thinking, so to speak. I don't know if that's the proper way of uh, looking at, it, but uh, again, you still apply the same thing to a lot of different uh, things that you do. Well, even driving or playing a musical instrument. Mm -hmm. I see some people. There was a beautiful video on on on. Uh, on uh, Facebook, where this guy goes up to the piano and starts playing. When somebody starts playing a piano like that, and you watch their fingers, and they're just dancing all over the keys. That's beautiful. That's something I really enjoy seeing. It's the same with uh, if you apply it to uh, martial arts as well. Watching somebody going through the process of uh, de uh, developing an interaction between somebody else and watching them uh, play with each other, learn learn each other, and try to figure each other out. That's that's quite a, a an interesting sort of interaction that's going on watching a person with that yeah. almost instinctual way of doing things, as you were talking before. So I really enjoy that aspect of things, but uh, I guess I've never really developed an enjoyment of uh, the 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 finer points of martial arts and fighting, I tend to avoid fights at all cost <laughs> as much as I possibly can. Um, I'll try to talk my way out of it. I'll do anything I can. If I have to face a person, okay, well, well I've, you know, sometimes there's no way out. You do what you have to do. <laughs> Whatever's available. Anything is a weapon. <laughs> but if I can avoid it, I will. Yeah, um, believe it or not, I do try to get out of fights. I've been in very few real fights because I'm always trying to get out of them. Um, if I oh, I believe it. If I have to get, if, if you put me into a situation where it's like I've tried everything I can to get out of this and you still want to push the situation, then yeah, I'm breaking something. But I'm most of the time I'm like, hold up, let's just, let's just chill. Um, but as far as the instinctual thing goes, my wife, and we're talking about music. My wife's a good example of that. She knows how to play the flute, and she's also been in drumming band before. So um, she knows cheap music. She knows how to play like different things. So I know that if she gets into that groove where she starts playing that those instruments, it's just going to come out. She's done the drills. She knows what she wants to express, and she's just going to express it. You know, yeah. it, it just comes out. Sorry about the noise. My son is going back and forth out there. Oh, okay. I'm afraid I can't see anything. <laughs> um, okay, here, here. <laughs> here you go. Here you go. All right. You said you were going to go play? Sorry, guys. There's real life happening here. Anyway, um, <laughs> as far as the music thing goes, I can also sort of... While I don't have the musical talent of my wife, I do at least know how to play some instruments, um, particularly the piano. That's my main instrument. And oh, yeah? I, um, when I'm on the keyboard and I start messing around with it, I can, like, you know, once I get into that kind of groove, I just kind of go with it. In fact, I've made up my own little compositions with the keyboard, simply because I sat in front of it for like an hour or so, messing with the keys, and I'm like, this sounds pretty good, and just built it. Um, when I'm doing um, beats with, well, every now and then when I decide to start making drum beats, I just go by instinct. I, there was a yeah. time I really wish I hadn't lost all my old music because I probably would have posted it up on YouTube by now. I used to just like, sit down in front of my computer and just make tunes. Um, just, yeah, I, I would just like start, um, I had some rinky dink computer program and later on I used to use um, a program on the first PlayStation called MTV Music Generator. Wasn't all that great, but you were able to make some really good stuff with it if you wanted to put the work in and really stretch that thing out to its limits. But you could do that. And I used to, like, you know, just break. I, I broke every single last one of their samples down to the most basic of notes just so I could make my own compositions out of it. And then I used Hammerhead to make my own drum beats over it and I would just overlay it. And after a while, I had, like, a whole bunch of MP3s that I just, like, I just did it for the hell of it. And it was fun. I would just sit down sometimes and just simply think of, like, I would, like, hum to myself or I'd think of one particular... Um, tune to work with, like just, just just a basic melody or a basic drum beat, and yeah. once I get lost in it, that's when I'm like, okay, I have something to work with, and I would just program that melody and build off of it, and the next thing I knew, two hours went by. 
And I was like, whoa, holy. And, and I would look at my work, I'm like, this is pretty good. Let me just trim this part here and refine this, and I got me a tune. Only <laughs> one tune has survived from all that work. There's only one tune. I'm really uh, mad at myself for losing all that music. But I know what you mean, being that, that kind of in, when instinct takes over and you're not thinking about it, you just do it. And well, do you find the same sort of thing? You, you do writing. You, you, you write stories. Do you find the same sort of thing happens, too? You lose time. You All of a sudden, you find you're sitting there for so many hours, and you're going, holy shit. <laughs> or where did the day go? Yeah, that happens when I finally get my brain to work. Um, it's one of those cliche things, like, you know, when you get writer's block, and they say well, it was one of the cliche lines of you got to let your characters just be themselves. That's when you get yeah. and suddenly you get some really good stuff. Um, yeah. When you you know just let your um, when you just let your mind go, you just like think about your characters for a moment. Like, okay, what's the personality of these? And that's if you made three dimensional freaking characters. Yeah. You're sort of thinking to yourself, what would they do? What would they say in this situation? And you just don't think about it. Just let them react to the situation and just write it down. Never mind if it goes according to the plan that you set for yourself. Just write it down. You may end up with something much better than what you intended. And yeah, you've lost time because at that point your rational mind hasn't really taken over. Now it's more your irrational one. It's working with your rational mind to make the scene make sense. Yeah. But at the same time, your characters are just doing what the hell it is that they want to do and uh -huh. make it work. And then suddenly you end up with a really you know, cool scene. You're like, wow, time has gone by. And uh, have you gone over some of your stuff before and you go back reading over it and you find, wow, this is really interesting. <laughs> What's it going to do next? <laughs> yeah, okay, um, Tyler, if you're, um, Tyler just asked a question. He's wondering what we've been talking about because he just got here. We're basically just oh. shooting shit. We're waxing philosophical. If there is a main topic, I would basically say it's based around the video I put out a little while ago about facts versus the narrative. Like, we're just basically talking about the many different ways that people will sometimes focus more on instinct and emotion rather than on rationality and factual, you know, thinking and thinking things through. And we're just basically going back and forth in different examples of it and how the mind basically works both ways. Like, you can be rational and logical, and that can be good in some instances, but in other instances, it can get you killed, like, say, in the middle of a fight. But on the other hand, thinking instinctually and emotionally, well, it can have, it can work really well in split-second reaction time, or if you're just simply trying to let your mind drift, or if you're working with something which is an emotional piece of art, it works well fine for that. But when it comes time to actually, you know, getting to the fact of, of situations, or if you're trying to research situations, then yeah, you sort of have to put that aside. So I guess we're just talking about the balance of both. We've dabbled on like martial arts as well, music and stuff, but everything seems to be circling around that particular topic. So, in case you're wondering that what it, what it is we've been talking about, that's pretty much it. Um, let's see what other questions. Um, Lonely City asked, "In my sword sparring, when I start to hold my fingers up, is waiting for my opponent to counter with the Austin Powers pinky." Yeah, this thing is just an artifact of my sword training. It's a Chinese sword thing. I'm going to go out on a limb and say, and people are going to get angry at me probably for saying it. After a while, you really don't need this. The, this is here for traditional reasons. I would even say shamanistic reasons. But the technical reason why when you first start training with a Chinese sword, you have the left hand like this is because it's training your right hand to hold the sword the proper way. Oh. That's pretty... I mean, you're going to hear a lot of BS about balancing energy out. Look, as long as my hand is stretched out this way when I do the stab, I don't. Need, you're already balanced. You don't need to have your finger like this. You know. The main re the only practical reason I see for holding your hand like this is because it's so much similar to when you hold this sword. It, you, you're holding it in that sort of loose grip. It's it, like if you look at this hand and you look at this hand, you see they're kind of similar. I mean, if I really wanted to be similar, I'd be going like that, but it's a lot easier to hold your hand like that than that. You're mirroring hand. You're, you're basically um, making both sides symmetrical which your body tends to work a lot easier that way. When the left hand is working in tandem with the right, you flow better. I've noticed this. Like Swordsmen who work with a, with a single-handed sword, if they keep this hand dead, this hand tends to somewhat be dead also instead. When this hand reacts with this one, you tend your moves tend to flow better because now your body is working in conjunction with each other. 
with itself. Like you're not one hand is one side isn't just the both sides are alive, so it's gonna help you to move that much more easily. But and having said that though, I think after a while when she get really good with it, you don't really need this hand to be like that anymore. I, my hand is just like this out of force of habit, and even then, if you notice, sometimes my hand just kind of got lazy, and I, it would just be more like this, because like I didn't need to be like this all the freaking time. So, to answer that question, that's that's why my hand was like that. It's just you know an after effect of my training, pretty much. But it's not in the grand scheme of things. I don't really think it has that much importance <laughs> once you get your technique down. Um, we actually have something of a question for you. From Third Eye, he goes since he's um, he was asking you what's your history, um, like something you, like what's your history like in animation? Like you were talking about, you really into animation and stuff. So I guess he's what he's really asking is what's your background? Like what are your interests in things? Oh, what am I? Oh, geez. Uh, well, uh, <laughs> you're talking like hobbies and stuff like that. Uh, I guessing. I've been kind of screwed up for a long. time period of time and kind of uh, working myself out. I like, yeah, I dabble with things and I mess around with things. I'm no real professional or expert at anything. I enjoy <laughs> I enjoy watching animations. Uh, I like philosophy. I like, uh, oh, I, I like going for hikes. <laughs> uh, I'm a truck driver. Uh, <laughs> I don't to tell you a little bit, <laughs> but uh, other than that, I'm an old man uh, who lives on his own, is trying to fix his house and trying to work to understand himself in some form or fashion, uh, getting a little bit more in touch with his uh, emotional side. It used to be repressed for since I was probably five years old or something like that, developed a lot of defense mechanisms uh, to protect myself against uh, some uh, environment, let's just say. <laughs> and uh, having to battle with all that sort of stuff, a uh, defense mechanism was basically to shut down my emotions so that people wouldn't uh, use them against me. And that's kind of screwed me up for a long period of time and make it very difficult to relate to people. Mm. Uh, I think it's about... Uh, 20, uh, 2010, where I finally got a chance to meet my older brother, and that started bringing back a whole lot of memories and uh, emotions, <laughs> anger, rage, certain things that I tried to cover up in myself, uh, tried to make everything look nicey-nicey, but uh, bringing back that rage kind of opened up a whole bunch of emotions, and... What I found fascinating was it opened up a whole, brought back a whole bunch of memories because emotions, and there's even been some study on this, that emotions are something that actually help you to recall a lot of memories. There's a kind of a, a, I guess you might call it a sort of a pointers to emotional uh, memory locations, let's say. Mm -hmm. So when you get the emotions cut off, you lose a lot of those memories when you get those emotions back, and that was a wild roller coaster ride. Uh, there were a lot of memories that come back to the point where I was able to take a stroll back through a lot of my history, and uh, well, help me a lot. Uh, <laughs> it's one of those things that uh, brings the joy of life back to you, and that sounds rather cliche, but <laughs> that's where I am right now. Uh, I like to go up north and uh, visit with my uh, my niece and my my uh, brother and uh, and my my nephew and we go out to uh, neighbors to go horseback riding and visit with them. A lot of fun up there. Mm -hmm. I love connecting with any kind of living thing, whether it be a uh, human or an insect or an animal. Uh, I find them all fascinating. All really great incentives for just being alive. Uh, I think I'm going on a little too much. <laughs> People get a little bit bored with that. There was something that you stated that um, there was something that you stated that um, really caught my attention and it was um, what you're talking about emotions sparking memory. Um, I'm thinking that is further proof, at least for me, 
that human beings are more emotional creatures than rational ones, but I'm also finding it rather interesting. I, I find that, you know, that's stuff I hadn't really heard of before, and that, that's, rather, that's really interesting and rather cool to think about, that it's, you know, it's that emotion, that rush of emotion that can get you to remember certain things. And, it, and I guess it makes sense because our memories tend to be things that either spark our emotion or trigger our emotion to begin with. Like, the reason why we hold on to memories to begin with is so because of how they made us feel. And when we can no longer feel anything about those emotions, that's when we tend to forget them. Because they no longer have that much importance to us. They're important to us because of how they made us feel at that moment. It was something about that memory that triggered something in you. And that thing that triggered in you wasn't a moment that made you feel like Spock. It was a moment that made you feel alive. And that's what emotions help to do. I guess it's also the same thing with, you know, with, in regards to music. Like so many times people have told stories about how a certain song will bring them back to a certain period, you know, in their history. And it's once again because that song triggered a memory that sparked a particular emotion in them. It, it's linked to a particular emotion that they had as well as to a particular time period. So I guess I would say that the emotional side of you is the part that's actually alive. Whereas, you know, the more rational side of you, it may, yes, yeah, analytical, but it can also be clinical and maybe even dead. Um, I mean, I don't want to go so far as to say dead, but it's certainly not bursting with that passion for life. That's, that's where the emotion um, comes in, which I guess as an aside is also one of my pet peeves with the whole Star Wars dichotomy when it comes to emotion and the dark side and light side, because while I do agree that you shouldn't let anger control you, saying that you need to be an emotional automaton to be good doesn't exactly work either. So but, but, but now let's get into the whole nerdy side of things. <laughs> no, actually, that was something that I found rather interesting, too, the idea that it's, uh, the dark side and the light side, you know, these things are kind of uh, amusing to me because when you look around you, there is not really anything out there that really points to a right and a wrong. I mean... It written in stone, something in reality that says this is right or this is wrong. And the only thing that I can see really has that kind of uh, borderline between the right and wrong is mm -hmm. death. I mean, when it comes down to it, that's the fundamental thing, isn't it? Do you want to be alive? Do you want not to be alive? Uh, these are the, the basic fundamentals. Uh, at about the age of 10 was when I actually contemplated the idea of suicide seriously and thinking that uh, I was really unhappy with my existence and I didn't think I should exist. But I had to come down to that point when I finally decided, okay, what's it going to be? Because over the other side, that's it, you know. Is there anything out there really worthwhile? And I don't know, I guess it's kind of like two things came up at once. Uh, one was a, an actual event, and another thing was a, kind of something imagination-driven. Uh, mm -hmm. I think it was just uh, about that time that uh, I had uh, my first introduction to science fiction from my grade four teacher. It kind of opened up a little bit of an, Im an imagination, uh, imaginary side to me. So while I was lying there contemplating it, I imagined uh, uh, another kid on another planet uh, who's looking out in the same situation that I am. So it was kind of funny. It was kind of like a sense that something beautiful that I wasn't alone. That yeah. was important. And also <laughs> a circumstance at the time, uh, I thought it wasn't important. And somebody came along and basically said, yes, you are. <laughs> What's so, that? You sometimes, sometimes you need, whether it's something that you bring out in yourself or whether it's something that somebody else says, we're social, we need to have a sense of worth. We all, yeah. I, I've noticed that about human beings. If you don't really have a sense of worth, if the way you're living either makes you, you know, if it's your lifestyle, whether it's the situation you're in, your society, whatever, if something is making you think that you have no worth whatsoever, that's when you start to break down. You have to like feel that you're, you know, you feel needed in some way, even if what it is that makes you feel needed is I'm the best trash collector this side of the, you know, <laughs> of whatever yeah, time. Absolutely, I you agree. Feel mm -hmm. Like you, you know, what you do matters, and yeah. ultimately, I mean, while I am one of those people that goes around saying that you yourself is what gives yourself, that you have to give yourself value. After a point, I mean. Your sense of worth has to ultimately be independent of what other people think of you. 
Yeah. But at the same time, it's really hard to do that because we're social creatures, and no matter how much we want to walk around, I don't need anyone's approval. Deep down, we want it. Otherwise, we wouldn't be hang. We, we wouldn't want friends if we didn't want the approval of somebody. <laughs> you know, it's it's, it's that we again that weird balance. In one sense, you have to have your own level of self worth to be able to carry you through. But in the other sense, I understand. You know, we're social creatures. We do need at least some sense of acceptance for some of the people. So again, it's that balance thing going on. Which I yeah, well, it, it's, it's that side of things where you look out and uh, when back then it was kind of a question of, we all develop these, uh, the, the, so we, we look for things. We look for, um, what do I like? What do I, you know, and, and for me back then it was like, what, what, what do I want? To, I want to like myself. <laughs> I want to like myself. Well, what would that entail? So you look at other people. I like this person. I don't like that person. What about this person do I like? What about that person do I not like? I don't want to be like that person because then I won't like myself. I want to be like this person and then I might like myself that way. So this experience keeps growing and building over a period of time and gets more and more complex. But that's very important, I think, uh, that one de Develop that sense of self-worth, that sense that I matter. Uh, if, if to no one else, at least to myself, and, and, and that idea of us being a social animal is a really fascinating one too to me, uh, because I find myself always interested in the, in in the way that not just humans but animals as well how they develop that. Now watch for their language, their body language, and see how they behave amongst each other. Mm -hmm. And try to see that we are connected. We're part of that. We're not as separate as the, the theists often try to make us seem. We're special. We're rational, but that rational side, again, I think that's more like a way of trying to make sense of everything is a way of being able to survive. It has survival value, definitely. But like they say, it's that aspect of the emotional side drives you to it first, and before you're just going to drive your action before anything else, and then you explain it away, and it creates that narrative that can form something in your mind that you can come back to time and time again. If it was just the emotional side by itself, it would be very hard to carry that. But both of them together, when you tie them together, it's a really fascinating structure that develops out to that. Huh. It's a good way of putting it, I think. I like that. I like that a lot. Hmm. Yeah, <laughs> I really generally do like that. Um, well, this kind of goes into, believe it or not, this really melds into somebody else's question, actually. I think it's good for me, but I think it'll work for you, too. It's from Lonely City 7. He's asking, what motivates you? And the reason why I'm thinking he might have directed that at me, because he goes, especially since you have so many pessimistic views about the world. <laughs> um... I'm not going to lie about that. Um, my wife makes a joke about it all the time. Um, about, like, right now, um, my new job has to deal with customer service. And one time she says, You know, it's funny to me how you're so good at customer service when you hate people. <laughs> and I was like, Yeah, I know, I know. But, then, but the funny thing is, I really don't. <laughs> okay. They get them, I'm frustrated with humanity. Wait, 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 wait. What? <laughs> you know what I mean? Don't you put words in my mouth? Turn over, Okay. I need to amend my statement. Yeah, you do. I'm frustrated <laughs> with people. I hate today's society. It gets on my freaking nerves. I know we can do a hell of a lot better. But human beings just in general, and when you start looking at, like, when you're actually able to deal with human beings individually, and when you actually start to see what human beings can be without all the bullshit, yeah, human beings are rather freaking cool. Alrighty then. If only they would allow themselves to be. And now I'm yeah. kind of going to what motivates me. I really want to somehow, you know, I really want to somehow try to find some way, even if it's just one freaking person, to get them to see that, no, life doesn't just have to be full of garbage and bullshit and running the rat race. What, I don't and, count? Well, if you count, that works. <laughs> Okay, that's what motivates me. That's what if you, if anyone's wondering what motivates me in life, what keeps me going, 
it's just that thing of trying to be an example of somebody who doesn't have to run the rat race, doesn't have to believe in bullshit ideologies, doesn't have to throw my life away for an invisible person or even a real person in order to make my life matter. I just want, you know, I want to be able to, like, have some people go, right, wait a minute, there is more than just this. And, you know, be able to achieve it and be happy with themselves. To so be able to, like, realize that, you know, there's nothing about you just as an, a human individual before all the crap that's been dumped on you. There's nothing about you that is ugly or abhorrent. You know, no matter what type of ideology tries to tell you otherwise. You've got religions basically telling you that you're, you know, you're full of sin and you're not worth living and it's only some invisible entity that demands you grovel in front of them in order for you to have any worth. You've got political ideologies who, in order to pull the wool over your eyes, are basically saying, well, you're selfish pieces of shit anyway, so it's okay for us to be selfish pieces of shit because that's what we do. That's how you get anywhere. And this is, you no, know, this does not have to be the reality that you have to accept, especially since we have tons of examples of otherwise. And that usually happens when, like, I've noticed that every now and then, every now and then, when something happens to pierce the veil, and shock people out of their automatic programming, they start acting decently. Whatever bullshit that they've been able to load it down on them goes away, if for a few minutes. But something, like, okay, good example I can give. There was some, this happened, what, last year? There was some KKK rally going on, right? And, yeah, it's because these guys happened to have done it in a place where they weren't exactly going to be appreciated. It didn't go down very well. So the next thing you know, a mob pretty much descended on these people and they had to run, and they were getting their asses kicked. And at one point, this one dude happened to be like up against the corner, and they were like stomping him out. And this one black girl, one young black woman, ran into the middle of that mob and threw herself over that guy to protect them, screaming at all the other people to leave him alone because they were pretty much acting like barbarians. That's the type of shit I'm talking about. Something sparked in her head for no longer see that guy as just some KKK nut. She saw him as a human being. Flawed his ideology may be. Hateful as his ideology may be, but at that moment he was somebody getting stomped out by people he had no way of defending himself from. And she saw him as a human being and ran in and tried to protect him with her own body. That's the shit. It's like, that's what I mean. It's like, this is, she woke up. For that split second, she woke the hell up. Hopefully, he woke up too. I don't know. We don't know the end of that story. I don't know the end of that story. That's the sort of shit that really chokes me up. <laughs> it's like, uh, like 9 11. Not to get cliche, but 9 11 is another good example I can give of that. Of course, then human beings, ugh, they disappointed me again by wasting that moment. But nonetheless, when those towers went down, for a few days. And you know the line, because it's become a cliche now. Suddenly everyone was an American. Yeah. People forgot the bullshit. All of a sudden, people were giving helping hands. There's volunteer work. You had black and white people. And, you know, even Muslims were, I think, for a little while before people started, you know, hating them. Oh. More. Cameras work. Everyone was, like, you know, trying to help each other out. It's such a tragedy. People were being human to one another. The ideology yeah. and bullshit that they were told about one another went out the window. They started remembering that, yeah, this person's got human DNA just like I do. They got needs. They got wants. They get hurt. They bleed. You reach out to them. And it's funny how when you know people personally, you can do that. But when you don't know them personally, whatever BS has told you about them, that's what you're pretty much going to believe. You just there's a bunch of faceless automatons, and it doesn't matter what I do to them. So if they get stomped out, it's like you're, not, it's like you're caring about the life of a roach. You don't give a shit. Yeah. That's what, if you want to know what motivates me, it's going against that. It's like, I, I want to, like, basically every now and then remind people, no, they're not worthless pieces of shit, yep. and because you aren't worthless pieces of shit, everyone else isn't either. And yeah, there are going to be people that cause me to scream at them and yell at them. Yeah, I'm going to be making videos where I talk about how much these people get on my freaking nerves, because they do. But at the end of the day... If there's one thing I want you to take away, no matter how much I may criticize a group of people or an ideology and all and all that, I still see them as human beings, and I'm hoping one day they will at least wake up to the fact that they're human, they matter, and that and because of that, that means everyone else does too. So maybe we should try to come up with something where everybody does matter. 
hope that answers that question. I guess you can now give your answer. That's a good. Uh, that's a good uh, answer. Uh, I wanted to try to modify the question a little bit to you to ask you this question that had plagued me for a period of time, but I finally I, I had been able to go back to it. But what's your earliest memory of what drives you that still sticks with you? Huh. Okay. I'll give you something to think about, uh, anyways, at least. <laughs> Ask her. I spent a long period of time debating with people, philosophizing about things, being lost in my own head, thinking about things. So I have, it's wait, like. Wait, you mean you came out of your head? <laughs> <laughs> How long have you two known each other? Oh, man. 99? Since 99. 99? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um. Actually, um, you seem to have a, a hmm? close history. <laughs> yeah, we like I said. I thought maybe even No, no, we've known each other since '99, but that's a long period of time. Next month is our tenth anniversary. Yeah. yeah. Next month will be our tenth anniversary. Hi. So I, mean, I don't even know how old. You are. <laughs> so a long period of time might seem a little bit. I, I mean, for me, it, it, 1957 is when I was born, so. <laughs> 99 is not long ago. As a matter of fact, I only quit smoking in 98. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm I'm 37 years old, born in the year of the dragon, 76. So, yeah, I look I'm older than I look. Um, if I I don't know if this is the earliest that I remember this, but I do remember distinctly thinking to myself, this is something I need to do. I was around 13 years old. And even then, I was hell in Catholic school. I blame that on my father, though, because he was the one who kept telling me, like, stuff. next time you go in there, you go ask the priest if they only believe in one God, why they have so many statues in the church. Go on, tell them, ask them. And then I'm the one ending up in detention because he told me to do something, I'd give him the shit. Um, <laughs> but the funny thing is... Wait, 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 wait. i got to ask you this. Your father was trying to get you to provoke <laughs> from the from, from the priest. Is that what he was doing? Was he an atheist? I come from a long family of mis of, of misfits and troublemakers and rebels. Okay, there's a reason why I am the way I am. Um, but but if I, I, well, I like. I'm not gonna blame him. I'm not gonna like you know yell at him for that or, or or you know call him a bad guy for that because if it wasn't for that, I wouldn't have had the questioning mind that I ended up with. The only problem is it later on went against him because he happens to be religious and I'm not. So ah, okay. it, 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 it's, it's funny. Like, I ended up questioning everything. <laughs> but the thing that I think what made me start thinking about it was um, I was 13, and even like I, I was I, that's when I started forming my own ideas on religion, and realizing that a lot of what was being taught just made no freaking sense. And it got to the point where I was debating adults over this. Like I couldn't talk to the other kids about it because the other kids just went over their heads. So I started talking to adults about this. And the adults would be looking at me like, I, and I know I was getting them like they were stuttering. What got me to start thinking about it is when they were talking about like, well, you know, we need Jesus because he saved us from original sin. And I'm like, but that doesn't really make any sense. It's like, okay, because this guy did something wrong, we all have to pay for it? I mean, according to you, we all are bad because these guys effed up. Yet, when we were in class, you don't blame me for something that the guy across, you know, a couple of rows did. It's like he, if he effed up, he effed up. If my parents <laughs> effed up, you're not going to punish me for it, are you? I mean, like if they burnt your house down, are you going to, like, unless you, I mean, I know there's some people who are so vindictive that they'll punish the entire freaking family, which then got me thinking about God, because remember, if you read the Ten Commandments, if you, if you um, disobey the First Commandment, he'll punish you up all the way to, all the, way to the seventh generation, so there is that. But... I remember arguing with her as a kid going, you know, if people who I don't even know messed up, how does it reflect on me? We don't even live, like, even as a 13-year-old, I realized we don't live this way. Like, if this guy screwed up, that guy screwed up. That's the one you're going to punish. That's the one you're going to throw in jail. That's the one you're going to, you know, throw in detention or whatever. But according to this almighty being, everyone's got to pay. <laughs> and because this guy screwed up, we're all worthless. This is pretty much what you're telling me. 
And she's like, well, you're not, you're not, I'm not saying you're worth it. She says, yeah, but that's pretty much what you're saying. If we can't go to heaven because we're pieces of shit because of what they did, we somehow end up lower than dirt because of something these guys did, which if you think about it, that also makes kind of no sense because if God, everything he does is perfect, what can sully that perfectness? Mm -hmm. We're now going into a different topic. And she really couldn't answer the question other than, well, you know, this is, God works in mysterious ways, we need him. And I'm like, I, I, I don't know if I really, I was like, okay, maybe, you know, at the time I didn't want to go so far as to say, I don't really need your God. But I was just simply saying, okay, maybe we need him, but I don't think I can go with the whole idea that we are worthless. I mean, you guys have your hymns all the time, we're all God's children. How can all God's children be worthless from the day that they're born? Unless they happen to take some wafer and holy water and then bow down to this invisible guy. It doesn't make any sense. So I walked out of that thinking to myself, the fact that she couldn't answer that question and the fact that I also got her to start thinking about the fact that she was, I'm like, I'm thinking, yeah, I am not worthless. I hope I got her to think she wasn't worthless too. Because <laughs> I like this teacher. She's one of my favorite. I think eight years old, considering suicide, was the constant bombardment of the idea of being worthless. Being unable to understand anything, being able to, be, being, uh, having something wrong with me. I mean, <laughs> this was something that's pound India over the time, and I really have that tendency to have that hostility when it comes to religion a lot of times, and the, 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 the compound bang in the head with that sort of thing from childhood that they do to their kids, it just, makes me crazy a lot of times and it just it takes a lot to just hold that back and put it down uh, for me I my, the earliest memory for me from 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 that sort of thing was I, I think and I, and I, I am, I'm very aware that it's possible that a lot of the memories that you have stored in your mind can get a little bit fuzzy yeah modified mm -hmm. <laughs> so to speak over time, as you remember them, you might recall them a certain way, and it may not necessarily be that way. But my earliest memory, I know there was a period of time I'm, I was going through, and I remember there was a period of time beforehand it wasn't as miserable. And then I started, I think, it was about the period that language started to influence me in certain ways. And that's when I started getting bombard, bombarded with the idea that uh, there's something wrong with you, that uh, there, there, there's... Uh, there, uh, what else is there? Uh, your your original sin, probably your original sin. Your 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 you know, and basically God's saying there's something wrong with you too, and all this sort of shit that compounds on you. And it wasn't until I started to get that language aspect of it into my life. I remember I know there was certain things that I found joyous about life before I understood language. I even remember, I think, learning to focus my eyes. But that point. Where they start to do that sort of thing, they destroy. I, I, I was basically thinking that I, I was unca incapable of understanding because when I asked questions, it was they were stupid, you know, this sort of thing. So it was just that sort of thing that gradually built up over a period of time. And then I had uh, another person who would basically manipulate me and basically compound that and reinforce that sort of thing. Uh, several people. And there was another party, another party that also <laughs> responsible for that sort of thing, and that was my acceptance, my interpretation of it. Yeah. <laughs> Everybody has that. There's the experience, and there's the interpretation, and there's the memory of it, and the interpretation of the memory, etc. And it all compounds to make you, you. But I think about two years old, I remember sitting there and thinking, it maybe not in words, but all I want, just one thing, to understand. I don't understand, and I didn't think I was capable of understanding it. It was very hard. But that's what motivates me, and even to this day, I find that's one of the most important things in my life, and that is to understand. So I'll sit back, and I'll listen, and I'll watch, and I'll see, and I'll try to interact with people in that on that light to try to further my understanding of things. So that's where I think I am, <laughs> anyways. <laughs> That's a good answer. That's actually a really good way of putting it, I think, just like what motivates us. If your motivation is to try to understand the world around you, I think that's a pretty damn good motivation. <laughs> um, I got, well, I've been a casual learner all my life. <laughs> there's a question that I had here that I was going to go to, but I wanted to touch on this one first. Right, the question I currently have up, I'll do that one next, 
and I have to hurry because we're now at 6 p.m., so i got to cut this off soon. But I want to touch on this other one first because I've, it kind of touches on you. Um, Lonely City asks, knowing Richard has had a history with mental illness, what about me? I have not. Um, there's, I've, I've it's not. surrounded you, though. It's surrounded me. Like, I know a lot of people like, have suffered from depression or suffered from anxiety or... Um, I, we've even, like, both of us have known some people who were borderline suicidal. Um, but me, myself, I've never really suffered from... We've known some more extreme cases. Too. Yeah. We've known some really crazy people. Um, you know what's really funny about that, uh, that question? I never once would have thought of myself as, something, as somebody who's experiencing a mental illness. Hmm. Never. Until that brought out, and then I had to stop and think for a second. That's that's interesting, actually. That's really interesting. Huh. I wonder if this would count as something that would be considered. Because here's the thing: like, um, I've gone through some situations where it's like been crushing at times, and some people, like later on when they find out about, it, they're like, "How the hell are we able to move on?" Part of it is because you know, usually I had somebody there to help support me, um, or you know, I had someone to pull through. But there's always been that thing in me, and I think it really was sparked by my grandmother years ago. But it was always there. It's like, if I give up, I lose. It's just this constant thing in my head. Like, I don't care what the hell is going on. It doesn't matter what happens. If I give up, I lose. It, and, that, and I don't want to lose. <laughs> um, I mean, it, it's weird. It's like, okay, if I'm playing a video game with you or I'm playing chess or whatever, okay, I'm competitive, but if I lose, okay, fine. It's a learning experience. But when it comes to life itself... I can't lose this shit. There's too much crap. It's like it's like I look around and I see all the crap that's going on. And I'm like, oh, I see this is a big game. It's a big game that someone else is playing, and they want all of us to lose. <laughs> I know it sounds conspiratorial, <laughs> but it's like seems like it's like they they you know they milk us for a while what we're worth. We get you know we barely make enough to make ends meet. We barely even have enough time to live the life the way we want to live. And it's like you constantly have this stone weighing down on you. If I give up, if I give into this, I lose. <laughs> So I just constantly keep having this thing of like, you know, like this sort of fuck you attitude when it comes to <laughs> I don't like walk around like I have a chip on my shoulder, mind you, but it's more of when things start slamming in, that's when I dig in my heels. It's like, it's almost as if, and I, I don't want to say it because it's not fair to say this because it implies that the people who do suffer from depression are allowing it. It's, and no, it's beyond their control. It's more yeah. of, but I tell myself, like, sometimes it's, like, it's almost like I feel like, no, I can't allow myself to get depressed. I can't allow myself to get, to get down. I got shit to do. <laughs> I got stuff to conquer. I got obstacles to get out of my way to get around. When I'm done with all this, then I can probably break down and cry some stuff. But right now, I got things to do. <laughs> and that's kind of kept me going and putting one foot in front of the other. And who knows, maybe that might be some type of mental problem because... I don't know too many other people who like. I know some people who are willing to at least sit back and give themselves a break, and I find that I sometimes feel like I can't do that. It's like no, I got. There's things that can happen. It drives my wife nuts sometimes. So, <laughs> you no, know, but I'm like, no, no, we, we can't, we can't relax. Shit's gonna happen. So you know, <laughs> that might be considered one. I don't know. Oh, that's an interesting perspective. It, 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 I. I'm not sure. Well, I already spoke about suicide, and there was, a, there was a certain point, but I had to confront that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. And, you know, ever since that point, I find there's something really – because I keep coming back to it, not in the sense that I want to commit – because I'll never, I'll, I'll never commit suicide. I'll fight. I'll stay alive. That's the way it is now. Back then, it was a different story. But I find there's something really fascinating about confronting that issue to face it and say – do I want to die? Do I want to live? To actually walk on that edge, that borderline, and say, this is the edge. This is where it's at. This is the pivotal point. This is the line between right and wrong, good and bad, life and death, if you want to look at it in those terms. So this is what gave me the inkling to think that I'm in possession of my own life because I own it. Anybody can come up and make a claim on my life. Mm. But they have to get my permission first. If I don't let them, <laughs> they can end my life, and they don't have it. Mm. Without that, 
I, I am in control of it. I have that power. That's a very important thing, I think. Yeah, and it is. It reminds me that, that uh, the idea of ownership of this life as a life, not just to extinguish it, but as a life, and what it takes to keep it going, I own that. Nobody else does. That's, that's true. That is certainly true. And if you have to, not to you know, sound vicious, but to quote Malcolm X, if you have to give it up, let it be even to even. <laughs> <laughs> um, we're going to a slightly lighter, slightly um, lighter topic, because I'm trying to go through, there's a lot of interesting questions here, and I'm trying to get through all of them quick before I have to cut this off. Um, I was then asked, um, do I still think beauty is a narcissistic concept, or would I accept some people are more beautiful than others, physically at least? See, here's the problem with that. What I consider to be beautiful may not necessarily be what somebody else considers to be beautiful, physically speaking. Okay, I was about to pick something, but everybody loves them, so that's not a good cho um, to um, choice to pick. I was about to say, like, I like redheads, but everybody likes redheads. Um, Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Are we talking about physical beauty, the visual aspect alone, or are we talking about something that's, you know, in here? Um, well, if we're talking about what's in here, then, well, I guess that could also be subjective, but I personally think that, you know, what we personally think is what makes somebody beautiful inside is more important than the physical. Because at the end of the day, it's all about how somebody makes us feel, whether we think that they're ultimately beautiful or not, like inside and out. But, at, in, but in this case, I'm mostly going to be speaking from a physical standpoint, because he asked me physically, at least, okay. would it accept that some people are more beautiful than others. And yes, I understand that, um, generally speaking, there are some attributes that some people might consider to be more beautiful or more attractive than others. However, having said, like, you know, like, if I happen to, like, make the stereotypical picture of the ugly person, most, like, a good majority of people will look at that and say, yeah, that's ugly. The problem is, when you start, like, talking about standards of beauty, there are going to be certain things that I like that other people don't like. There are going to be certain things that um, I don't like that other people will like, even when it comes to physical attraction. Um, I'm trying to think of like certain traits. Like if we're going to be talking like, like okay, I'm a, I'm a heterosexual dude, so I guess if we're going to be talking about physical beauty, we'll be talking about women. There are certain things I know other people go crazy over that I'm like, eh, I, or I don't like at all. Um, I know people go crazy over women with blue eyes. For the longest time, I found it to be the least attractive trait <laughs> um, on someone. I, it, I, I think it was because I associated it with bad things happening because the one time something bad, really bad almost happened, it was because of a blue-eyed person. And before anybody makes a stupid interpretation, no, this is not a strike on white people. I liked white people a lot even back when I was a kid. But it was just that when I saw somebody with blue eyes, I was like, they might have an ulterior motive. Because I remember the first time I ever met somebody with blue eyes, we almost got screwed over by that person. It wasn't until I met my wife that I'm like, okay, blue eyes are all right. Though, to be fair, she has more glass eyes than blue eyes because her eyes keep changing colors. Um, but generally... Yeah, people know about glass. Yeah, that's true. Well, generally her eyes tend to switch from like blue to gray to green depending on the lighting and on her mood and what she's wearing and things like that. But yeah, I know it's like people, oh my God, those blue eyes. And I'm like, yeah, I they don't take this like to, it's something that I don't really consider to be that big a deal. Um, other people they consider to be like a higher standard of beauty. Um, I like oh another thing is some people happen to have an aversion to people with dark skin. I happen to have a special I happen to really like women with really really dark skin. It's not just because of you know you know my own particular you know ethnicity because quite frankly when it comes to women as long as they look good I really don't care what color their skin is. But that happens to be an attractive thing for me when it happens to be pretty dark and they happen to have really bright eyes on top of it. Um, I find that to be a standard of beauty. Other people may not. Some people like fat asses. Other people don't. Some people like smaller breasts. Some people like bigger breasts. With women, it runs the gamut as well. Some women like the really muscle-bound, you know, younger Arnold Schwarzenegger-looking types. Other people like somebody with a more slender figure. Some people like um, people with brown hair. Other people with, you know, with, you know, with blonde hair. It's Short hair, long hair, um, tall, you know. It, there's all these different range of features. And while you can talk in generalities about, you know, what one person would consider to be a, a beauty standard, I think it kind of runs the gamut when it comes to physical beauty. And only when we start looking at people who look kind of deformed 
that we start saying things like, oh, they're ugly. And even then, if that person who looks deformed happens to have a personality that makes us feel good inside or good about ourselves, then we stop ha um, hampering on that physical, the way they physically look, and we just start seeing them as a beauty of soul, a beautiful human being, and we don't even talk about how they look anymore. So, I don't know if that answers your question, but that's how I feel when it comes to like physical beauty. I feel like <laughs> it kind of runs the gamut. I don't, I mean, I, I don't really want to say that, okay, some people are more beautiful than others. The only way I'll say that is if we're taking, talking about the whole of an individual. Because, like, if we're going to just simply talk about physical looks, then I'd say it's like, you know, beauty is an eye of the beholder. But if we're talking about the whole of a human being, then, yeah, you'll find me saying certain things like, yeah, I think um, Sarah Palin is a rather ugly individual. It has nothing to do with how she looks. It has to do with the whole of the individual. Get what I'm saying? It's like it's the person, not how they look, which is going to make me say whether they're beautiful or not. So I don't know if you want to add anything to that. Uh, I don't really know if I can add anything to that. I mean, beauty, again, what you were talking about, the heterosexual aspect of it, and uh, I find it funny because most of the time, there are lots of times that people make the reference to uh, being heterosexual, and I'm kind of getting the impression, oh, you, you think I was... Uh, saying something like I was attracted to you or something like that, and I really don't answer or say anything about it. I let them go on their own mind. Uh, personally, I'm very attracted to women for for much more than sometimes I even think I can understand. Uh, there's something about them. There's a mystery. There's a strength. There's a... I, I can't really understand. Well, of course, the form is beautiful. Uh, there's something about that too mm -hmm. uh, and at the same time I can say also that the male form is quite beautiful and then I but but I've never felt sexually aroused by it so it's uh, am I gay or am I or am I straight I have to say right now I'm straight <laughs> I haven't been aroused by the male yet so <laughs> if it ever happens or comes along that way, that's uh, that that that'll probably turn into a different story. But right now, mm -hmm. I find I'm absolutely attracted to uh, to to women, uh, one in particular. But uh, <laughs> I don't seem to. Uh, I would I was pretty screwed up at the time. My my ex wife uh, and and that didn't work out. So I let that go. Um, but <laughs> sometimes you ha hang on to these. Uh, these thoughts of, I wonder if it could have been different if I had my frame of mind now compared to the frame of mind I had back then. Uh, anyways, that's just wistful uh, wanderings uh, more than anything else. Yeah. Beauty, you're right, there's a certain aesthetic appeal. There's certain things you, that are going to say, wow. <laughs> um, but there's always that I don't know. Nowadays, my whole idea of relationship and looking at at someone is to look into the soul. Well, I, I'm not theistic or anything, but I have my own idea of the soul, and it's more reality based. And I tend to want to dig into a person to find out what that person is. That exploration that fascinates me. Uh, that's all I can put to that one. Okay. All right, I'm going to lead this to one last question, but to be fair, I'm going to try to lump up other questions in with it because I think it's a big enough question that I can try to fit certain things. I really would like to touch on everything because some of you guys left some really nice stuff on here, but it's getting kind of long. So here's the main question. First of all, I, I kind of like um, Tyler Lalonde's um, funny one. He says, they used to ask why for everything, but his mom told him to stop asking. Because I still ask it to myself all the time about everything, <laughs> which is what you should do, because there's just too much in life to not try to figure out why. That's going to be Ben in 10 years. Yeah. <laughs> um, but here's the big question, and I think I can try to lump up a, at least one other question in there. Third Eye, Seventh Dimension asks, do I um, think there's a difference between people versus person, meaning a group versus an individual, that we must understand in order to solve some key problems in the world, like organized religions, politics, etc. 
The questions that I think I can also kind of lump into that is more of a personal one that I was asked by Lonely Cities, asking me if I sometimes have to act more black among more stereotypical black people. I think this kind of goes into that because you're talking about the individual versus the group and whether you need to meld in with the group. Um, to answer, to go with that more specific question for me, the answer is no. And it's led to some interesting conversations and situations because of that. Granted, I will notice that sometimes my, all right, if I'm going to be, you might have noticed this, you guys, yourselves on my videos. I will modulate my speech patterns a little bit depending on the topic. So, for instance, if I'm talking about something serious, you will notice that I try to, for lack of a better word, sound a bit more professional. If I'm, like, doing a Dark Souls 2 video with it on the hand, I'm just letting it all hang out. <laughs> You know, it's just like, I don't really care if I'm cursing here or there or acting goofy or say a stupid line. It all has to be a frame of reference. Now, if I'm um, we're among a group of black people, I'm not going to change who I am while I'm around them. And this has led to some rather interesting... Um, <laughs> a couple of people have gotten cursed out by me because I'm assuming stupid shit because of that. But for the most part, I usually get more like a, man, you, you know, you're different from a lot of other people I've met. It's, yeah, because I allow myself to be me. I don't allow the group to dictate who I am. The way I grew up, I knew I was different. I may have liked, it's like, here's the thing. I grew up in the 80s with a lot of other people my age, obviously, and there were certain things that everyone within a certain group was into. I was into hip-hop. I grew up with hip-hop. I I'm one of the people who saw the people break dancing in the freaking parks on cardboard. I know real hip hop when I see it, which is why these days I can't stand the music, but that's another video for another freaking time. <laughs> um, I grew up with the stuff, loved the music. Didn't really like the fashion sense. Well, everyone, else, I mean, this is one of the funniest things that I can relate. When I was a teenager, everyone else started wearing, you know, the baggy clothes and the backwards baseball caps and the funny haircuts and all that. That wasn't me. <laughs> I was like, I was the kid walking around in jeans and like regular size sneakers and a t-shirt underneath and an uh, overshirt over. Like the way you tend to see me dressing right now was pretty much how I was dressing. Kind of, I was still kind of formulating my, my fashion sense at the time. But once I hit around 16, 17, I pretty much knew how I wanted to dress. And it went all the way up until now. And it didn't really follow the fashion trend of urbanites at the time because I thought it freaking looked ridiculous. And no amount of peer pressure was going to make me feel otherwise. Likewise, certain things that people liked and certain things that people said, I wasn't into it. The way people talked, I wasn't into it because I was always told by my Haitian parents that you're supposed to fully enunciate your words. And there was no, I mean, I, so I'm not going to change, I'm not going to dumb myself down or I'm not going to change who I am just because I'm around a whole bunch of other people who happen to sound a certain way. But I notice that because of that, I get respected more. Because they know that I'm willing, and I even tell them that, look, I'm not, look, I'm not down with that. I don't really like that. It's like, it, I like this aspect, I like this aspect, I like this aspect, but I don't feel that I have to completely go all in just because you guys and other people expect me to act that way. It's not who I am. And quite frankly, I know half of you motherfuckers don't act, aren't really that either. You're just doing it because everyone else is. <laughs> Like, I'm asking, like, you, I know you read comic books on the side. You, I know that when you, when you get home, you get out of those jeans. You, you don't even like 50 Cent. Like, it's like, you, but you only act that way because everyone else is. And this leads me to other cultures. This isn't just a black thing. Oops. You okay? Yeah. This isn't just a black thing. I see this with everybody. I've been around, like, certain white groups where they, you know there's a certain way they expect it to act, and I see that one guy in the corner, and he's like, <laughs> he's not into it either. Yeah, everyone else is talking about, you know, the latest Crew album, and he's just like, eh, eh. Meanwhile, he comes over to me, so, you got any more of that EPMD? <laughs> it was like, it's always that peer pressure to try to, like, the group says, this is how you're supposed to be. What if I'm not? It's like, I'm not. This is not who I am. Yeah, I mean, my wife, she finds it kind of funny. Like, yeah, there's a lot of old school hip-hop I like to play. And every now and then, she she hasn't grown up about that. So she will ask me, what did they mean by that? How does that sound like there? But that's one thing I noticed that she finds kind of funny is that I don't really sound like them. 
I know the slang. I can, you know, I know the terminology. I can tell her what it means. I laugh at it. But my day-to-day -day life, that's not how I act because this isn't how I was raised. Yeah, and it's like growing up, that just wasn't my thing. The funny thing is, some of my brothers, that is their world. I have at least two brothers who, that's how they talk, that's how they speak. They're very intelligent. Yeah. But you, you talk, you, you can still understand, but pretty much if you listen to them, they almost sound like they came straight out of the Wu-Tang Clan. But they are very bright, college-educated individuals. That's who they are. That's their world. It's not mine. I, I have a different outlook. I have a different way of going about things. The group is not going to tell me who I am. And people outside the group are certainly not going to tell me who I am. But I'm noticing that that same pressure isn't just within my so-called group. And I say so-called because this has gotten me into trouble. I've made a video about this. If you want to lump me into a group, don't say well, he's, he's part of the black community. There's no real black community anymore as there is there's a white community. Because I see a whole lot of white people hating on each other. I'll never forget that yeah. one person so that one dude called point to a, um, a Polish person and call him subhuman. So don't give me this shit about you being lumped into a community just because of how much melanin you have in your skin. It's bullshit. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, if you want to put me in a group, put me with the miscreants. Put me with the outcasts. Put me with the nerds. That's my group. I'm the guy causing trouble <laughs> because I happen to know this wrong with the freaking political system. I'm the guy who geeks out because there's a new Doctor Who coming out. That me. <laughs> That's the group I'm with. Mm -hmm. Yes, I know. I will get that thing. But I'm not saying it's not. I've got a tablet to look at it. I know. Um, but again, it's like I'm noticing the same pressures with so-called, like, you know, like, say white groups, for instance. There's certain things that they expect white people to do. They expect white people to be into, like, bland things. They expect white people to not be able to be into funky music. They expect white people that only like bland food. They expect, they expect white people to have no soul. That's bullshit. I, look, I've not met, a, I've met some white people with better rhythm and movement than a lot of black people I knew growing up. Bullshit. There is nothing about just being within a certain group that makes you have to act like or be like another group just because you are expected to be that way. It's complete garbage. And so to answer that main question, do I think there's a difference between people versus a, an individual? Yes. Individuals are all going to come up with their own ideas. Now, there are going to be social pressures that is going to... I've seen it all the time. Like Certain things that I know that person didn't like, they're going to end up saying they like it or even force themselves to like it because that's what the group says that they should. And they'll get used to that. But it isn't really what they are. What are you guys doing? <laughs> Games. Can you wait for a second? I'm almost finishing this up. I'm going to wrap this up in a bit, but you guys are going to have to play the well, games later. Then, go outside for a little while longer. <laughs> Sorry, guys, for the interruption. <laughs> well, if you can wait for a bit, just give me like about 10, 15 minutes and I'll be done. All right? That's my, that's my son and that's his friend. They want to play games. One of the reasons why I knew I had to wrap this up, but just wait for a bit. Right. No, I turned the volume to no volume. Mm -hmm. Man, I love this game. Oh, God. <laughs> Looks like I'm going to wrap this up. Okay, guys. <laughs> no, it's okay. <laughs> I hope I answered the question real quick. Uh, if I didn't answer the question enough, I'll send you guys a private PM. If you really want, I'll do a video on it. But I really do think that the whole separation between the group and the individual does need to be respected. While there has there has to be a balance between the individual and the group, there has to be a balance between the the talents and um, contributions of the individual versus the needs of the society that they're living in. I understand that there are social pressures on people, and there I even believe that there's certain duties that one has if they're going to live within a society to help sustain it. But the society should also, in turn, nurture the individual, not suppress them. If there's something about that particular individual that is unique and can add something to the society, it should be recognized and it should not be suppressed just because of the name of expectation. So if you have a particular group that is expected to be a certain way, but there's someone within that particular society who's not that way and they're not harming anything, and in fact that individuality can actually add to the community, leave them alone. Respect that individual voice that they have because that's the only way the society is going to nurture and grow, because they'll be able to see something that the others can't. 
I was able to see things that people in my so-called group couldn't because I had a different outlook. And when I expressed it, it turned their minds around. They're like, whoa, we, I didn't think of it that way. Of course you wouldn't because you're in one frame of mind, I'm in another. But at the same time, they would say something that would make me go, oh, wow, that's interesting. Because again, I'm not. It, that's how it works. This is how society flourishes. So yep. there has to be a balance between the two. That's that's what I got to add to that. Then we hog all that up. So if you have anything to add, or if you have a perspective, now's the time before I have to cut this short. <laughs> <laughs> no, I I couldn't say it any better than that. I think you got right onto that. I've always been more of an, a, a kind of a loner, staying off my own. Uh, very shy of uh, of attention from people. <laughs> in fact, I used to keep out of sports because I remember trying to play some sports when I was a kid in school, and uh, somebody I get attention. It was like, you know, getting applause or something like that because I was good in a goalie net or whatever the case may be. And I like I want to get out of here. <laughs> I don't like this, so I kind of shied away from all that kind of stuff and went off on my own. Uh, that I don't know. There's something funny about that sort of thing, like. Uh, I don't want to screw up somebody else's uh, expectations or something like that. The sooner or later, I'm going to fuck up, and they're <laughs> be sitting there jumping all over me. So I'd rather get away from that potential. Oh <laughs> yeah. uh, well. I could definitely understand that. Yeah. Okay. On that note, I am going to cut this short. I got some kids to wrangle. <laughs> probably going to be a little place in the The battle begins. <laughs> So I hope, you know, the guys who are watching this, I hope you've enjoyed it, whether you're watching this live or whether you're going to be watching this later. I hope you guys um, enjoyed the, um, the conversation we had. I certainly did. We definitely ran the gamut <laughs> like I thought we would end up doing. Um, I, I'm sorry I could not get to everybody's question. I thought that I'd be able to do it, and it just didn't really happen. But hopefully you guys, I, hopefully I touched on enough of them so you guys can, you know, feel satisfied with it. Um... And I'll probably be doing another one of these things soon. Um, what I really would like to do at some point is with some of the people who I've communicated with over the years throughout the comment section, hopefully I'll be able to do like a hangout with them as well, maybe with like one person or two people or whatever, because I think that would also be interesting. So we'll, we'll see if I can try to set something up with that. So anyway, hope you guys enjoyed it. Richard, I thank you once again for setting this up. It was fun. All right. Thank you very much. I really appreciate it and enjoyed myself a great deal. All right. So, everybody, take care. Um, I got some more videos coming soon. Looks like we're yeah. Dark Souls one. So, catch you guys later.